Flight Through Tomorrow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Derek Beaver. Flight Through Tomorrow by Stanton A. Koblenz. Nothing was further from my mind when I discovered the release drug, Relin than the realization that it would lead me through as strange and ghastly and revealing a series of adventures as any man has ever experienced. I encountered it, in a way, as a mere byproduct of my experiments. I am a chemist by profession, and as one of the staff of the Morgan Stern Foundation have access to some of the best equipped laboratories in America. The startling new invention, I must call it that, though I did not create it deliberately, came to me in the course of my investigations into the obscure depths of the human personality. It has long been my theory that there is, in man, a psychic entity which can exist for at least brief periods apart from the body, and have perceptions which are not those of the physical senses. In accordance with these views, I have been developing various drugs, compounded of morphine and adrenaline, whose object was to shock the psychic entity loose for limited periods, and so to widen the range and powers of the personality. I shall not go into the details of my researches, nor tell by what accident I succeeded better than I had hoped. The all-important fact, a fact so overwhelming that I shudder and gasp and marvel, even as I tell of it, is that I did obtain a minute quantity of a drug which, by putting the body virtually in a state of suspended animation, could release the mind to travel almost at will across time and space. Yes, across time and space, for the drag of the physical having been stricken off, I could enter literally into infinity and eternity. But let me tell precisely what happened that night, when at precisely 10.08 in the solitude of my apartment room, I swallowed half an ounce of Relin and stretched myself out on the bed, well knowing that I was taking incalculable risks and that insanity and even death were by no means remote possibilities of the road ahead. But let that be as it may, in my opinion there is no coward more despicable than he who will not face danger for the sake of knowledge. My head reeled, and something seemed to buzz inside it as soon as the bitter half-ounce of fluid slipped down my throat. I was barely able to reach the bed and throw myself upon it when there came a snapping as of something inside my brain, then, for a period, blankness. Then a gradual awakening with that feeling of exhilaration one experiences only after the most blissful sleep. I opened my eyes, feeling strong and light of limb, and charged with a marvelous vital energy, but... As I peered about me, my lips drew far apart in astonishment, and I am sure that I gaped like one who has seen a ghost. Where were the familiar walls of my two-by-four room, the bureau, the book rack, the ancient portrait of Pasteur that hung in its glass frame just above the foot of the bed? Gone! Vanished as utterly as though they had never been. I was standing on a wide and windy plain with the gale beating in my ears and with rapid sunset-colored clouds scudding across the blood-stained west. Mingled with the wailing of the blast, there was a deep sobbing sound that struck me in successive waves, like the ululations of great multitudes of far-off mourners. And while I was wondering what this might mean and felt a prickling of horror along my spine, the first of the portents swept across the sky. I say portents, for I do not know by what other term to describe the apparitions. High in the heavens, certainly at an altitude of many miles, the flaming things swept across my view, comet-shaped and stretching over at least ten degrees of arc, Swift as a meteor, brilliantly flesh-red, sputtering sparks like an anvil, and leaving behind it a long, ruddy trail that only slowly faded out amid the darkening skies. It must have been a full minute after its disappearance before the hissing of its flight came to my ears, a hissing so sharp, so nastily insistent that it reached me even above the noise of the wind, and more than another minute had passed before the earth beneath me was wrenched and jarred as if by an earthquake, and the most thunderous detonations I had ever heard burst over me in a prolonged series. Let me emphasize that none of this had the quality of a dream. It was clear-cut, as vivid as anything I had ever experienced. My mind worked with an unusual precision and clarity, and not even a fleeting doubt came to me of the reality of my observations. This is some sort of bombing attack, I remember reflecting, some assault of super-monsters of the skies, perfected by a super-science. And I did not have to be told the fact. I knew, as by an all-illuminating inner knowledge, that I had voyaged into the future. Even as this realization came to me, I made another flight, and one that was in space more than in time. It did not surprise me, but I took it as the most natural thing in the world, when I seemed to rise and go floating away through the air. 
It was still sunset time, but I could see clearly enough as I went drifting at a height of several hundred yards above a vast, desolated space near the junction of two rivers. Perhaps, however, desolated is not the word I should use. I should say, rather, shattered, pulverized, obliterated, for scene of more utter and hopeless ruin I have never seen nor imagined. Over an area of many square miles there was nothing but heaps and mounds of broken stone, charred and crumbling brick, fire-scarred timbers, and huge contorted masses of rustling steel like the decaying bones of superhuman monsters. From the great height and extent of the piles of debris, and from the occasional sight of the splintered cornice of a roof or of some battered window frame or door, I knew that this had once been a city, one of the world's greatest, but no other recognizable feature remained amid the gray masses of ruins, and the very streets and avenues had been erased. But here and there a tremendous crater, three hundred feet across and a hundred to a hundred and fifty feet deep, indicated the source of destruction. As if to reinforce the dread idea that had taken possession of my brain, one of the comet-like red prodigies went streaking across the sky even as I gazed down at the dead city, and I knew, as clearly as if I had seen the whole spectacle with my own eyes, that the missile had sprung from a source hundreds or thousands of miles away, possibly across the ocean, and that, laden with scores and tons of explosives, it had been hurled with unerring mechanical accuracy upon its mission of annihilation. Then I seemed to float over vast distances of that sunset-tinted land, and saw great craters in the fields, and villages shot to ribbons, and farms abandoned. And the wild dogs fought for the wild cattle, and thistles grew deep on acres where wheat had been planted, and weeds sprouted thickly in the orchards, and blights and mildew competed for the crops. But through here and there I could see a dugout, with traces of fire and abandoned tools flung about at random. Nowhere in all that dismal world did I observe a living man. After a time I returned to a place near the ruined city, by the two rivers and in the rocky palisades above one of the streams I made out some small circular holes barely large enough to admit a man, and, borne onwards by some impulse of curiosity and despair, I entered one of these holes and went downward, far downward into the dim recesses. And now, for the first time, at a depth of hundreds of yards, I did at last encounter living men. My first thought was that I had gone back to the day of the caveman, for a cave-like hollow had been scooped out in the solid rock. It was true that the few hundreds of people huddled together there had the dress and looks of moderns. It was true also that the gloom was lighted for them by electric bulbs, and that electric radiators kept them warm. Yet Dante himself, in painting the ninth circle of his inferno, could not have imagined a drearier and more despondent group than these that slouched and drooped and muttered in that cavernous recess, seated with their heads fallen low upon their knees, or moodily pacing back and forth like captives who can hope for no escape. Here, at least, we will be safe from the sky, marauders, I heard one of them muttering, yet I could not help wondering what the mere safety of the body could mean when all the glories of man's civilization were annihilated. There came a whirring in my head and another blank interval, and when I regained my senses I knew that another period of time had passed, possibly months or even years. I stood on the palisade above the river near the entrance of the caves, and the sun was bright above me. But there was no brightness in the men and women that trailed out of a small circular hole in the ground. Drab as dock rats and pasty pale of countenance as hospital inmates, with bent backs and dirty, tattered clothes and a mouse-like nosing manner, they emerged with the wariness of hunted refugees, and they flung up their hands with low cries to shield them from the brilliance of the sun to which they were evidently unaccustomed. From the packs on their backs and the bundles in their hands, I knew that they were emerging from their subterranean refuge to try to begin a new life in the ravaged world above. My heart went out to them, for I saw that, few as they were, not more than fifty in all, they were the sole survivors of a once populous region, would have a bitter fight to wage in the man-made wilderness that had been a world metropolis. But as they roamed above through the waste of ash and rubble, and as they wandered abroad where the fields had been and saw how every brush and tree had been seared from the earth or poisoned by chemical brews, I knew that their fight was not merely a bitter one. It was hopeless. As I heard them muttering among themselves, we have not even any tools, and again, we have no fuel left for the great machines. For they had lived in a highly mechanical world, and the technicians who alone understood the workings of that world had all been destroyed, and the sources of power had all been cut off and power was food without which they would not long survive. Unable to endure their haggard, hangdog looks and grim, despondent eyes, I went wandering far away, over the length and breadth of many lands. 
and nowhere did I see a factory that had not been hammered to dust, nor a village that had not been unroofed or burnt, nor a farm where the workers went humming on their merry, toilsome way. Yet here and there I did observe little knots of survivors. Sometimes they were half-clad groups, lean and ferocious as famished wolves, who roamed the houseless countryside with stones and clubs, hunting the wild birds and hares, or making meager meals from barks and roots. Sometimes three or four men, with the frenzied eyes and hysterical shrieks and shouts of maniacs, would emerge from a brush hut by a river flat. Sometimes little bands of men and women, in a dazed, aimless way, would go wandering about a huge, jagged hole in the ground, where their homes and loved ones lay buried. I came upon solitary refugees high up on the scarred mountain slopes, with nothing but a staff to lean upon and a deerskin to keep them warm. I saw more than one twisted form lying motionless at the foot of a precipice. I witnessed a battle between two half-crazed, ravenous bands with murder and cannibalism and horrors too grisly to report. I observed brave men resolutely trying to till the soil, whose productive powers had been ruined by a poison spray from the sky, and I noted some who, though the fields remained fertile enough, had not the seed to plant, and others who had not the tools with which to plow and reap, and some who, with great labor, managed to produce enough for three or four mouths, had twenty or thirty to feed and where the three or four might have lived, the twenty or thirty perished. Then, with a great sadness, I knew that man, having become civilized, cannot make himself into a savage again. He has come to depend upon science for his sustenance, and when he himself has destroyed the means of employing that science, he is as a babe without milk. And it is not necessary to destroy all men to exterminate mankind. One need only take from him the prop of his mechanical inventions. Again there came a blankness, and I passed over a stretch of time, perhaps over years or even decades, and I had wandered far in space, to an island somewhere on a sunny sea, and there once more I heard the sound of voices. And somehow, through some deeper sense, I knew that these were the voices of the only men left anywhere on the whole wide planet, and I looked down on them, and saw that they were but few, no more than a dozen men and women in all, with three or four children among them. But their faces, unlike those which I had seen before, were not haggard and seamed, nor avid like those of hunting beasts, nor distorted by fury or famine. Their brows were broad and noble, and their eyes shone with the sweetness of great thoughts, and their smiles were as unuttered music, and when they glanced at me with their clear, level gaze, I knew that they were such beings as poets had pictured as dwellers in a far tomorrow. And I did not feel sad, though I could not forget that they were the only things in human form that one could find on all earth's shores. And though I knew that they were too few to perpetuate their kind for long, somehow I felt a vast benevolent spirit in control, that these most perfect specimens of our race should endure when all the wreckers had vanished. As I watched, I saw the people all turning their eyes to an eastern mountain, whose summit still trailed the golden of the dawn clouds. And from above the peak a great illuminated sphere, like a chariot of light, miraculously came floating down, and the blaze was such that I could hardly bear to look at it. And exclamations of wonder and joy came from the people's throats, and I too cried out in joy and wonder as the radiant globe descended, and as it alighted on the plain before us, casting a sun-like aura over everything in sight. Then through the sides of the enormous ball, I would not say through the door, for nothing of the kind was visible. A glorious being emerged, followed by several of his kind. He was shaped like a man, and no taller than a man, and yet there was that about him which said he was greater than a man. For light seemed to pour from every cell of his body, and a golden halo was about his head, and his eyes shot forth golden beams so intense and so magnetic that once having observed them, I could hardly take my gaze away. With slow steps he advanced, motioning the people to him, and they drew near and flung themselves before him on the ground and cried out in adoration. And I too threw myself to earth in worship of this superhuman creature, and I heard the words he spoke, and with some deeper sense I translated them, though they were not uttered in any language I knew. Out of the stars we come, O men, and back to the stars we shall go, that the best of your race may be transplanted there, and survive through means known to us, and again be populous and great. Through the immense evil within the breasts of your kind, you have been purged and all but annihilated, but the good within your race has also been mighty, and can never be expunged, and that good has called through you surviving few to us your guardians, 
that we may take you to another planet and replenish you there, and teach you that lore of love and truth and beauty which the blind members of your species have neglected here while they unfitted the earth for human habitation. So speaking, the Radiant One motioned to the people who arose and followed him inside the great sphere of light, and when they had all entered it slowly began to ascend, and slowly dwindled and disappeared against the morning skies. And now, I knew, there was no longer a man left anywhere on earth, yet as I gazed at the deserted shore, the empty beach and the bare mountainside, a sense of supreme satisfaction came over me, as though I knew that in the end, after fire and agony and degradation, all was eternally well. That sense of supreme satisfaction remained with me when, after still another blank interval, I opened my eyes as from a deep slumber, and stared at the familiar book rack, the bureau, the mottled paper walls of my own room. The clock on the little table at my side indicated that the hour of 10.09. In other words, all that had happened had occupied the space of one minute. Yet I know as surely as I know that I write these words, that the release drug had freed my spirit to range over thousands of miles of space and that I have looked on people and events which no other eye will view for scores, hundreds, or even thousands of years to come. End of Flight Through Tomorrow by Stanton Arthur Koblenz Recording by Derek Beaver By Frederick Brown and Mac Reynolds This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite Happy Ending by Frederick Brown and Mac Reynolds Sometimes the queerly shaped Venusian trees seemed to talk to him, but their voices were soft. They were loyal people. There were four men in the lifeboat that came down from the space cruiser. Three of them were still in the uniform of the Galactic Guards. The fourth sat in the prow of the small craft, looking down at their goal, hunched and silent, bundled up in a greatcoat against the coolness of space, a greatcoat which he would never need again after this morning. The brim of his hat was pulled down far over his forehead, and he studied the nearing shore through dark-lensed glasses. Bandages, as though for a broken jaw, covered most of the lower part of his face. He realized suddenly that the dark glasses, now that they had left the cruiser, were unnecessary. He slipped them off. After the cinemonographic rays his eyes had seen through these lenses for so long, the brilliance of the color below him was almost like a blow. He blinked and looked again. They were rapidly settling toward a shoreline beach. The sand was a dazzling, unbelievable white such as had never been on his home planet. Blue the sky and water, and green the edge of the fantastic jungle. There was a flash of red in the green as they came still closer, and he realized suddenly that it must be a Maragi, the semi-intelligent Venusian parrot once so popular as pets throughout the solar system. Throughout the system blood and steel had fallen from the sky and ravished the planets, but now it fell no more. And now this. Here, in this forgotten portion of an almost completely destroyed world, it had not fallen at all. Only in some place like this, alone, was safety for him. Elsewhere, anywhere, imprisonment, or more likely death. There was danger even here. Three of the crew of the space cruiser knew. Perhaps some day one of them would talk. Then they would come for him, even here. But that was a chance he could not avoid. Nor were the odds bad, for three people out of a whole solar system knew where he was, and those three were loyal fools. The lifeboat came gently to rest. The hatch swung open, and he stepped out and walked a few paces up the beach. He turned and waited while the two spacemen who had guided the craft brought his chest out and carried it across the beach and to the corrugated tin shack just at the edge of the trees. That shack had once been a space radar relay station. Now the equipment it held was long gone, the antenna mast taken down, but the shack still stood. It would be his home for a while, a long while. The two men returned to the lifeboat, preparatory to leaving. And now the captain stood facing him, and the captain's face was a rigid mask. It seemed with an effort that the captain's right arm remained at his side, but that effort had been ordered. No salute. 
The captain's voice, too, was rigid with unemotion. Number one? Silence! And then, less bitterly, come further from the boat before you again let your tongue run loose here. They had reached the shack. You are right, number— No, I am no longer number one. You must continue to think of me as Mr. Smith, your cousin, whom you brought here for the reasons you explained to the under-officers before you surrender your ship. If you think of me so, you will be less likely to slip in your speech. There is nothing further I can do, m Mr. Smith? Nothing. Go now. And I am ordered to surrender the— There are no orders. The war is over. Lost. I would suggest, though, as to what spaceport you put into. In some you may receive humane treatment. In others— The captain nodded. In others there is great hatred. Yes. That is all? That is all. And, Captain, your running of the blockade, your securing of fuel en route, have constituted a deed of high valor. All I can give you in reward is my thanks. But now go. Good-bye. Not good-bye, the captain blurted impulsively. But, hasta la vista, auf Wiedersehen, until the day. You will permit me for the last time to address you and salute? The man in the great coat shrugged. As you will click of heels, and a salute that once greeted the Caesars, and later the pseudo-Aryan of the twentieth century, and, but yesterday, he who was now known as the last of the dictators. Farewell, number one. Farewell, he answered emotionlessly. Mr. Smith, a black dot on the dazzling white sand, watched the lifeboat disappear up into the blue, finally into the haze of the upper atmosphere of Venus that eternal haze that would always be there to mock his failure and his bitter solitude. The slow days snarled by, and the sun shone dimly, and the marigees screamed in the early dawn, and all day, and at sunset, and sometimes there were the six-legged baroons, monkey-like in the trees that gibbered at him, and the rains came and went away again. At nights there were drums in the distance, not the martial roll of marching, nor yet a threatening note of savage hate. Just drums, many miles away, throbbing rhythm for native dances, or exercising perhaps the forest night demons. He assumed these Venetians had their superstitions. All other races had. There was no threat for him in that throbbing that was like the beating of the jungle's heart. Mr. Smith knew that, for although his choice of destinations had been a hasty choice, yet there had been time for him to read the available reports. The natives were harmless and friendly. A Terran missionary had lived among them some time ago, before the outbreak of the war. They were a simple, weak race. They seldom went far from their villages. The space radar operator who had once occupied the shack reported that he had never seen one of them. So there would be no difficulty in avoiding the natives, nor danger if he did encounter them. Nothing to worry about, except the bitterness. Not the bitterness of regret, but of defeat defeat at the hands of the defeated, the damned Martians who came back after he had driven them halfway across their damned planet, the Jupiter Satellite Confederation landing endlessly on the home planet, sending their vast armadas of spacecraft daily and nightly to turn his mighty cities into dust. In spite of everything, in spite of his score of ultra-vicious secret weapons and the last desperate efforts of his weakened armies, most of whose men were under twenty or over forty. The treachery even in his own army, among his own generals and admirals. The turn of Luna, that had been the end. His people would rise again, but not, now after Armageddon, in his lifetime. Not under him, nor another like him, the last of the dictators. Hated by a solar system, and hating it. It would have been intolerable, save that he was alone. He had foreseen that, the need for solitude. Alone he was still number one. The presence of others would have forced recognition of his miserably changed status. Alone his pride was undamaged, his ego was intact. The long days and the Marigis' screams and slithering swish of the surf, the ghost-quiet movements of the baroons in the trees and the raucousness of their shrill voices. Drums. Those sounds, and those alone. But perhaps silence would have been worse. For the times of silence were louder. Times he would pace the beach at night, and overhead would be the roar of jets and rockets, the ships that had roared over New Albuquerque, his capital, in those last days before he had fled. 
the crump of bombs and the screams and the blood and the flat voices of his folding generals. Those were the days when the waves of hatred from the conquered peoples beat upon his country as the waves of a stormy sea beat upon crumbling cliffs. Leagues back of the battered lines you could feel that hate and vengeance as a tangible thing, a thing that thickened the air, that made breathing difficult and talking futile. And the spacecraft, the jets, the rockets, the damnable rockets, more every day and every night, and ten coming for every one shot down. Rocket ships raining hell from the sky, havoc and chaos and the end of hope. And then he knew that he had been hearing another sound, hearing it often and long at a time. It was a voice that shouted invective and ranted hatred and glorified the steel might of his planet and the destiny of a man and his people. It was his own voice, and it beat back the waves from the white shore. It stopped their wet encroachment upon this, his domain. It screamed back at the Baroons, and they were silent. And at times he laughed, and the Marajis laughed. Sometimes the queerly shaped Venusian trees talked, too, but their voices were quieter. The trees were submissive. They were good subjects. Sometimes fantastic thoughts went through his head. The race of trees, the pure race of trees that never interbred, that stood firm always. Some day, the trees. But that was just a dream, a fancy. More real were the Marjis and the Kiths. They were the ones who persecuted him. There was the Marji who would shriek, All is lost! He had shot at it a hundred times with his needle gun, but always it flew away unharmed. Sometimes it did not even fly away. All is lost! At last he wasted no more needle darts. He stalked it to strangle it with his bare hands. That was better. On what might have been the thousandth try he caught it and killed it, and there was warm blood on his hands and feathers were flying. That should have ended it, but it didn't. Now there were a dozen Marjis that screamed that all was lost. Perhaps there had been a dozen all along. Now he merely shook his fist at them or threw stones. The Kiths, the Venusian equivalent of the Terran ant, stole his food. But that did not matter. There was plenty of food. There had been a cache of it in the shack meant to restock a space cruiser and never used. The Kiths would not get at it until he opened a can, but then unless he ate all of it at once, they ate whatever he left. That did not matter. There were plenty of cans, and always fresh fruit from the jungle, always in season, for there were no seasons here except the rains. But the Kiths served a purpose for him. They kept him sane by giving him something tangible, something inferior, to hate. Oh, it wasn't hatred at first, mere annoyance. He killed them in a routine sort of way at first, but they kept coming back. Always there were Kiths, in his larder, wherever he did it, in his bed. He sat the legs of the cot in dishes of gasoline, but the Kiths still got in. Perhaps they dropped from the ceiling, although he never caught them doing it. They bothered his sleep. He'd feel them running over him, even when he'd spent an hour picking the bed clean of them by the light of the carbide lantern. They scurried with tickling little feet, and he could not sleep. He grew to hate them, and the very misery of his nights made his days more tolerable by giving them an increasing purpose. A pogrom against the kiffs. He sought out their holes by patiently following one bearing a bit of food, and he poured gasoline into the hole and the earth around it taking satisfaction in the thought of the writhings in agony below. He went about hunting kiffs to step on them, to stamp them out. He must have killed millions of kiffs. But always there were as many left. Never did their number seem to diminish in the slightest, like the Martians. But unlike the Martians, they did not fight back. Theirs was the passive resistance of a vast productivity that bred kiffs ceaselessly, overwhelmingly, billions to replace millions. Individual kiffs could be killed, and he took savage satisfaction in their killing, but he knew his methods were useless save for the pleasure and the purpose they gave him. Sometimes the pleasure would pall in the shadow of its utility, and he would dream of mechanized means of killing them. He read carefully what little material there was in his tiny library about the kiff. They were astonishingly like the ants of Terra, so much that there had been speculation about their relationship. That didn't interest him. How could they be killed? En masse. Once a year, for a brief period, they took on the characteristics of the army ants of Terra. They came from their holes in endless numbers and swept everything before them in their devouring march. He wet his lips when he read that.
perhaps the opportunity would come then to destroy, to destroy, and destroy. Almost Mr. Smith forgot people and the solar system and what had been. Here in this new world there was only he and the Kiths. The Baroons and the Marajis didn't count. They had no order and no system. The Kiths. In the intensity of his hatred there slowly filtered through a grudging admiration. The Kiths were true totalitarians. They practiced what he had preached to a mightier race, practiced it with a thoroughness beyond the kind of man to comprehend. Theirs the complete submergence of the individual to the state. Theirs the complete ruthlessness of the true conqueror, the perfect selfless bravery of the true soldier. But they got into his bed, into his clothes, into his food. They crawled with intolerable tickling feet. Nights he walked the beach, and that night was one of the noisy nights. There were high-flying, high-whining jet craft up there in the moonlight sky, and their shadows dappled the black water of the sea. The planes, the rockets, the jet craft, they were what had ravaged his cities, and turned his railroads into twisted steel, had dropped their H-bombs on his most vital factories. He shook his fist at them and shrieked imprecations at the sky. And when he had ceased shouting there were voices on the beach, Conrad's voice in his ear, as it had sounded that day when Conrad had walked into the palace, white-faced, and forgotten the salute. There is a breakthrough at Denver, number one. Toronto and Monterey are in danger, and in the other hemispheres, his voice cracked, the damned Martians and their traitors from Luna are driving over the Argentine. Others have landed near New Petrograd. It's a rout. All is lost. Voices crying, number one, hail, number one, hail. A sea of hysterical voices, number one, hail, number one. A voice that was louder, higher, more frenetic than any of the others. His memory of his own voice, calculated but inspired, as he'd heard it on playbacks of his own speeches. The voices of children chanting, To thee, O number one. He couldn't remember the rest of the words, but they had been beautiful words. That had been at the public school meet in the new Los Angeles. How strange that he should remember here and now the very tone of his voice and inflection, the shining wonder in the children's eyes. Children only, but they were willing to kill and die for him, convinced that all that was needed to cure the ills of the race was a suitable leader to follow. All is lost. And suddenly the monster jet craft were swooping downward, and starkly he realized what a clear target he presented, here against the white moonlit beach. They must see him. The crescendo of motors as he ran, sobbing now in fear for the cover of the jungle, into the screening shadow of the giant trees and the sheltering blackness. He stumbled and fell, was up and running again, and now his eyes could see in the dimmer moonlight that filtered through the branches overhead, stirrings there in the branches, stirrings and voices in the night, voices in and of the night, whispers and shrieks of pain. Yes, he'd shown them pain, and now their tortured voices ran with him through the knee-deep night-wet grass among the trees. The night was hideous with noise red noises, an almost tangible din that he could nearly feel as well as he could see and hear it. And after a while his breath came raspingly, and there was a thumping sound that was the beating of his heart and the beating of the night. And then he could run no longer, and he clutched a tree to keep from falling, his arms trembling about it, and his face pressed against the impersonal roughness of the bark. There was no wind, but the tree swayed back and forth, and his body with it. Then, as abruptly as light goes on when a switch is thrown, the noise vanished. Utter silence. And at last he was strong enough to let go his grip on the tree and stand erect again, to look about, to get his bearings. One tree was like another, and for a moment he thought he'd have to stay here until daylight. Then he remembered that the sound of the surf would give him his directions. He listened hard and heard it, faint and far away. And another sound, one that he had never heard before faint also, but seeming to come from his right and quite near. He looked that way, and there was a patch of opening in the trees above. The grass was waving strangely in that area of moonlight. It moved, although there was no breeze to move it, and there was an almost sudden edge beyond which the blades thinned out quickly to barrenness. And the sound, it was like the sound of the surf, but it was continuous. It was more like the rustle of dry leaves, but there were no dry leaves to rustle. 
Mr. Smith took a step toward the sound and looked down. More grass bent and fell and vanished even as he looked. Beyond the moving edge of devastation was a brown floor of the moving bodies of kiths. Row after row, orderly rank after rank, marching resistlessly onward, billions of kiths, an army of kiths, eating their way across the night. Fascinated, he stared down at them. There was no danger, for their progress was slow. He retreated a step to keep beyond their front rank. The sound, then, was the sound of chewing. He could see one edge of the column, and it was a neat, orderly edge, and there was discipline, for the ones on the outside were larger than those in the center. He retreated another step, and then quite suddenly his body was afire in several spreading places. The vanguard, ahead of the rank that ate away the grass. His boots were brown with kiffs. Screaming with pain, he whirled about and ran, beating with his hands at the burning spots on his body. He ran head-on into a tree, bruising his face horribly, and the night was scarlet with pain and shooting fire. But he staggered on, almost blindly, running, writhing, tearing off his clothes as he ran. This, then, was pain. There was a shrill screaming in his ears that must have been the sound of his own voice. When he could no longer run, he crawled, naked now, and with only a few kiffs still clinging to him, and the blind tangent of his flight had taken him well out of the path of the advancing army. But stark fear and the memory of unendurable pain drove him on. His knees raw now, he could no longer crawl. But he got himself erect again on trembling legs and staggered on catching hold of a tree and pushing himself away from it to catch the next. Falling, rising, falling again, his throat raw from the screaming invective of his hate. Bushes and the rough bark of trees tore his flesh. Into the village compound just before dawn staggered a man, a naked terrestrial. He looked about with dull eyes that seemed to see nothing and understand nothing. The females and young ran before him, even the males retreated. He stood there swaying, and the incredulous eyes of the natives widened as they saw the condition of his body and the blankness of his eyes. When he made no hostile move they came closer again, formed a wondering, chattering circle about him, these Venusian humanoids. Some ran to bring the chief and the chief's son, who knew everything. The mad, naked human opened his lips as though he were going to speak, but instead he fell. He fell as a dead man falls. But when they turned him over in the dust they saw that his chest still rose and fell in labored breathing. And then came Alwa, the aged chief, and Rana, his son. Alwa gave quick excited orders. Two of the men carried Mr. Smith into the chief's hut, and the wives of the chief and the chief's son took over the earthling's care and rubbed him with a soothing and healing salve. But for days and nights he lay without moving and without speaking or opening his eyes and they did not know whether he would live or die. Then at last he opened his eyes, and he talked, although they could make out nothing of the things he said. Narana came and listened, for Narana of all of them spoke and understood best the earthling's language, for he had been the special protege of the Terran missionary who had lived with them for a while. Narana listened, but he shook his head. The words, he said, the, the words are of the Terran tongue, but I make nothing of them. His mind is not well. The aged Alwa said, Aye, stay beside him. Perhaps as his body heals, his words will be beautiful words, as were the words of the father of us, who, in the Terran tongue, taught us of the gods and their good. So they cared for him well, and his wounds healed, and the day came when he opened his eyes and saw the handsome blue-complexioned face of Narana sitting there beside him. And Narana said softly, Good day, Mr. Man of Earth. You feel better, no? There was no answer, and the deep sunken eyes of the man on the sleeping mat stared, glared at him. Nirana could see that those eyes were not yet sane, but he saw, too, that the madness in them was not the same that it had been. Nirana did not know the words for delirium and paranoia, but he could distinguish between them. No longer was the earthling a raving maniac, and Nirana made a very common error, an error more civilized beings than he have made often. He thought the paranoia was an improvement over the wider madness. He talked on, hoping the earthling would talk too, and he did not recognize the danger of his silence. "'We welcome you, earthling,' he said, and hope that you will live among us as did the father of us, Mr. Gerhardt. He taught us to worship the true gods of the high heavens, Jehovah and Jesus and their prophets, the men from the skies. 
He taught us to pray and to love our enemies. And Nirana shook his head sadly. But many of our tribe have gone back to the older gods, the cruel gods. They say there has been great strife among the outsiders, and no more remain upon all of Venus. My father Alwa and I are glad another one has come. You will be able to help those of us who have gone back. You can teach us love and kindliness." The eyes of the dictator closed. Nirana did not know whether or not he slept, but Nirana stood up quietly to leave the hut. In the doorway he turned and said, We pray for you. And then, joyously, he ran out of the village to seek the others who were gathering bela berries for the feast of the fourth event. When with several of them he returned to the village, the earthling was gone. The hut was empty. Outside the compound they found, at last, the trail of his passing. They followed, and it led to a stream, and along the stream until they came to the taboo of the green pool, and could go no farther. He went downstream, said Alwa gravely. He sought the sea and the beach. He was well, then, in his mind, for he knew that all streams go to the sea. Perhaps he had a ship of the sky there at the beach, Nirana said worriedly. All earthlings come from the sky. The father of us told us that. Perhaps he will come back to us, said Alwa. His old eyes misted. Mr. Smith was coming back all right, and sooner than they had dared to hope. As soon, in fact, as he could make the trip to the shack and return, he came back dressed in clothing very different from the garb the other white man had worn. Shining leather boots and the uniform of the Galactic Guard, and a wide leather belt with a holster for his needle gun. But the gun was in his hand when, at dusk, he strode into the compound. He said, I am number one, the lord of all the solar system, and your ruler. Who was chief among you? Alwa had been in his hut, but he heard the words and came out. He understood the words, but not their meaning. He said, Earthling, we welcome you back. I am the chief. You were the chief. Now you will serve me. I am the chief. Alwa's old eyes were bewildered at the strangeness of this. He said, I will serve you, yes, all of us, but it is not fitting that an earthling should be chief among the whisper of the needle gun. All was wrinkled hands went to his scrawny neck, where just off the center was a sudden tiny pinprick of a hole. A faint trickle of red coursed over the dark blue of his skin. The old man's knees gave way under him as the rage of the poisoned needle dart struck him, and he fell. Others started toward him. Back, said Mr. Smith. Let him die slowly, that you may all see what happens to— But one of the chief's wives, one who did not understand the speech of earth, was already lifting Alwa's head. The needle-gun whispered again, and she fell forward across him. I am number one, said Mr. Smith, and lord of all the planets. All who oppose me die by— And then suddenly all of them were running toward him. His finger pressed the trigger, and four of them died before the avalanche of their bodies bore him down and overwhelmed him. Nirana had been the first in that rush, and Nirana died. The others tied the earthling up and threw him into one of the huts. And then, while the women began wailing for the dead, the men made counsel. They elected Kalana chief, and he stood before them and said, The father of us, the Mr. Gerhardt, deceived us. There was fear and worry in his voice and apprehension on his blue face. If this be indeed the Lord of whom he told us, he is not a god, said another. He is an earthling, but there have been such before on Venus, many, many of them who came long and long ago from the skies. Now they are all dead, killed in strife among themselves. It is well. This last one is one of them, but he is mad. And they talked long, and the dusk grew into night while they talked of what they must do, the gleam of firelight upon their bodies, and the waiting drummer. The problem was difficult. To harm one who was mad was taboo. If he was really a god, it would be worse. Thunder and lightning from the sky would destroy the village. Yet they dared not release him. Even if they took the evil weapon that whispers its death and buried it, he might find other ways to harm them. He might have another where he had gone for the first. Yes, it was a difficult problem for them. But the eldest and wisest of them, one Magani, gave them at last the answer. O Kalana, he said, let us give him to the Kiths, if they harm him. And old Magani grinned a toothless, mirthless grin. It would be their doing, and not ours. Kalana shuddered. It is the most horrible of all deaths, and if he is a god, 
If he is a god, they will not harm him. If he is mad and not a god, we will not have harmed him. It harms not a man to tie him to a tree." Kalana considered well, for the safety of his people was at stake. Considering he remembered how Alwa and Narana had died, he said, It is right. The waiting drummer began the rhythm of the council end, and those of the men who were young and fleet lighted torches in the fire and went out into the forest to seek the kiffs who were still in their season of marching. And after a while, having found what they sought, they returned. They took the earthling out with them then, and tied him to a tree. They left him there, and they left the gag over his lips because they did not wish to hear his screams when the kiths came. The cloth of the gag would be eaten too, but by that time there would be no flesh under it from which a scream might come. They left him, and went back to the compound, and the drums took up the rhythm of propitiation to the gods for what they had done. For they had, they knew, cut very close to the corner of a taboo. But the provocation had been great, and they hoped they would not be punished. All night the drums would throb. The man tied to the tree struggled with his bonds, but they were strong, and his writhings made the knots but tighten. His eyes became accustomed to the darkness. He tried to shout, I am number one, Lord of— And then, because he could not shout, and because he could not loosen himself, there came a rift in his madness. He remembered who he was, and all the old hatreds and bitterness welled up in him. He remembered, too, what had happened in the compound, and wondered why the Venusian natives had not killed him, why instead they had tied him here alone in the darkness of the jungle. Afar he heard the throbbing of the drums, and they were like the beating of the heart of night, and there was a louder, nearer sound that was the pulse of blood in his ears as the fear came to him. The fear that he knew why they had tied him here, the horrible, gibbering fear that, for the last time, an army marched against him. He had time to savor that fear to the utmost, to have it become a creeping certainty that crawled into the black corners of his soul as would the soldiers of the coming army crawl into his ears and nostrils, while others would eat away his eyelids to get at the eyes behind them. And then, and only then, did he hear the sound that was like the rustle of dry leaves in a dank black jungle, where there were no dry leaves to rustle nor breeze to rustle them. Horribly, number one. The last of the dictators did not go mad again. Not exactly. But he laughed and laughed and laughed. End of Happy Ending by Frederick Brown and Mac Reynolds in the future. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Reynard. Lost in the Future by John Victor Peterson. Did you ever wonder what might happen if mankind ever exceeded the speed of light? Here is a profound story based on that thought, a story which may well forecast one of the problems to be encountered in space travel. They had discovered a new planet, but its people did not see them until after they had travelled on. Albrecht and I went down in the shuttle ship, leaving the Stellatomic orbited pole to pole 2,000 miles above Alpha Centauri's second planet, while we took an atmosphere brushing approach which wouldn't burn off the shuttle skin, we went as swiftly as we could. A week before we had completed man's first trip through hyperspace, we were now making the first landing on an inhabited planet of another sun. All the preliminary investigations had been made via electron spectroscope and electron telescopes from the Stellatomic. We knew that the atmosphere was breathable and were reasonably certain that the peoples of the world into whose atmosphere we were dropping were at peace. We went unarmed, just the two of us, 
it might not be wise to go in force. We were silent, and I know that Harry Albrecht was as perplexed as I was over the fact that our all-wave receivers failed to pick up any signs of radio communication whatever. We had assumed that we would pick up signals of some type as soon as we had passed down through the unfamiliar planet's ionosphere. The scattered arrangement of the towering cities appeared to call for radio communications. The hundreds of atmosphere ships flashing along a system of airways between the cities seemed to indicate the existence of electronic navigational and landing aids. But perhaps the signals were all tightly beamed. We would know when we came lower. We dropped down into the airway levels, and still our receivers failed to pick up a signal of any sort. Not even a whisper of static. And strangely, our radar scopes failed to record even a blip from their atmosphere ships. I guess it's our equipment, Harry, I said. It just doesn't seem to function in this atmosphere. We'll have to put Edwards to work on it when we go back upstairs. We spotted an airport on the outskirts of a large city. The runways were laid out with the precision of Earth's finest. I put our ship's nose eastward on a runway and took it down fast through a lull in the atmosphere ship traffic. As we went down, I saw tiny buildings spotted on the field which surely housed electronic equipment. But our receivers remained silent. I taxied the shuttle up to an unloading ramp before the airport's terminal building and I killed the drive. Harry, I said, if it weren't that their ships are so outlandishly stubby and their buildings so outflung, we might as well be on Earth. I agree, Captain. Strange, though, that they're not mobbing us. They couldn't take this Delta Wing job for one of their ships. It was strange. I looked up at the observation ramp's occupants. People who, except for their bizarre dress, might well be of Earth, and saw no curiosity in the eyes that sometimes swept across our position. Be that as it may, Harry, we certainly should cause a stir in these pressure suits. Let's go. We walked up to a dour-looking individual at a counter at the ramp's end. Clearing my throat, I said rather inanely, Hello. But what does one say to an extra Solarian? I realised then that my voice seemed thunderous, that the only other sounds came from a distance. The city's noise, the atmosphere ship's engines on the horizon. The Centaurian ignored us. I looked at the atmosphere ships in the clear blue sky, at the Centaurians on the ramp who appeared to be conversing, and there was no sound from those planes, no sound from the people. It's impossible, Harry said. The atmosphere is nearly Earth normal. It should be... Well, damn it, it is a sound conductive. We're talking, aren't we? I looked up at the Centaurians again. They were looking excitedly westward. Some turned to companions. Mouths opened and closed to form words we could not hear. Wide eyes lowered, following something I could not see. Sick inside, I turned to Albrecht and read confirmation in his drawn, blanched face. Captain, he said. I suspected that we might find something like this when we first came out of hyperspace and the big sleep. The recorders showed we'd exceeded light speed in normal space-time, just after the transition. Einstein theorised that time would not pass as swiftly to those approaching light speed. We could safely exceed that speed in hyperspace, but should never have done so in normal space-time. Beyond light speed, time must conversely accelerate. These people haven't seen us yet. They certainly just observed our landing. As we suspected, they probably do have speech and radio, but we can't pick up either. 
We're seconds ahead of them in time, and we can't pick up from the past sounds of nearby origin or nearby signals radiated at light speed. They'll see and hear us soon, but we'll never receive an answer from them. Our questions will come to them in their future, but we can never pick up answers from their past. Let's go, Harry, I said quickly. Where? he asked. Where can we ever go that will be an improvement over this? He was resigned. Back into space, I said. Back to circle this system at near light speed. The computers should be able to determine how long and how slow we'll have to fly to cancel this out. If not, we are truly and forever lost. End of Lost in the Future by John Victor Peterson Master of None, this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Wiley Sears. Master of None by Neil Goebel. The advantages of specialization are so obvious that today we don't even know how to recognize a competent syncretist. Freddy the Fish glanced at the folded newspaper beside him on the bench. A little one-column headline caught his eye. Mysterious signals from outer space. Probably from Cygnus, he said. Freddy mashed a peanut, popped the meat into his mouth, and tossed the shell to the curb in front of the bench. He munched idly and watched two sparrows arguing over the discarded delicacy. The victor flitted to the head of a statue, let go a triumphant dropping onto the marble nose, and hopped to a nearby branch. Serves him right, Freddy said. He yawned and rubbed the stubble on his chin. Not yet long enough for scissors, he decided. He pulled his feet up on the bench, twisting in an effort to get comfortable. The sun was in his eyes, so he reclaimed the discarded newspaper and spread it over his face. His eyes momentarily focused on mysterious signals from outer space, right over his nose. Sure, Cygnus, he muttered, and closed his eyes and dropped off to sleep. When he was awakened, it was by an excited hand shaking his shoulder and a panting, Freddy, Freddy, look at the extra just came out. Freddy slowly sat up ascertained the identity of the intruder and the fact that the sun was setting, and said, Good evening, Willie. Please stop rattling that paper in my face. But just read it, Freddy, Willie shrieked, waving the paper so frantically that Freddy couldn't make out the big black headline. Positive contact from another planet, the guy was yelling. They put out an extra, so I snitched one from the boy. Read it to me, huh, Freddy? I'm dying a curious. So give it here and I'll read it for you. Quit shaking it or you'll tear it all up, Freddy snorted. Read it to me, huh, Freddy? Willie said, handing over the paper. I don't know no one else that reads so good. Freddy studied the headline in the first paragraph silently, then whistled lightly and lowered the paper. You know, Willie, he said, the last thing I read before I dropped off a while ago was about these signals. But the funny thing is, I just assumed they were from Cygnus. What's Cygnus, Freddy? Willie asked, still pop-eyed. A smoke? A dame? Or you mean like from hunger? Cygnus, my boy, Freddy explained patronizingly, is a constellation within which there are two colliding galaxies. These colliding galaxies produce the most powerful electromagnetic radiations in the universe, an undecillion watts. What's an undecillion? An undecillion is 10 raised to the 36th power, Freddy sighed, fearing that he wasn't getting through to Willie. No fooling. What's a what? Oh, you're pulling my leg again, Freddy. Talking riddles. Where'd you ever learn to talk that way, anyhow? Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Oxford, Georgia Tech, Oklahoma. 
Picked up a little here, a little there, Freddy said, reflecting on his indiscriminate past. Oh, cut it out, Freddy. Come on, read it to me. Bet you can't. Where'd you say it was from? Cygnus? Not Cygnus, Ganymede. Freddy cleared his throat and rattled the newspaper authoritatively. Washington, White House sources declared today that intelligent beings on a Jupiter moon have contacted the United States government. While the contents of the message have been made secret, the White House emphasized the message was friendly. Freddy continued, The signals, which were intercepted yesterday, were decoded this morning by a team of government scientists and cryptographers who had been at the task all night. While officials were noncommittal about the nature of the message contained in the signals, they declared, We are authorized to state that the received message was friendly and appears to represent a sincere attempt by another race of intelligent beings to contact the people of Earth. A reply message is being formulated. Officials further explained that the possibility of the signals being a hoax had been thoroughly investigated and that there is no doubt whatsoever that the message is a genuine interspatial communication from intelligent beings on Ganymede. Ganymede is one of the twelve moons of the planet Jupiter and is larger than the planet Mercury. Freddy stopped. Ain't there any more? Willie whined. The rest of it is about how far away Ganymede is and its relative density and mass and stuff. You wouldn't be interested, Willie. Oh, I guess not. Willie helped himself to a peanut. What's it mean, Freddy? Nothing much, Willie. Just that there's people somewhere besides here on Earth and they called us on the phone. What do you know about that? Willie gasped. I didn't even know they was other people. He stared with disbelief at the paper. I don't suppose anyone knew. How do you suppose they knew, Willie asked. I mean that we was here if we didn't know they was there. I've been wondering about that, Willie. You know that last rocket we shot? From Cape Carnival, you mean? Yeah, it was supposed to go into orbit around Jupiter. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe it didn't land on Ganymede. The people there could have examined it, figured out where it came from, and then radioed us on the same frequency the rocket transmitter used. Paper doesn't say that, of course, but it's a reasonable hypothesis. Freddy, I think you must be a genius or something. Freddy smiled and stretched out to sleep again as Willie wandered off, staring blankly at the newspaper. Carlton Jones, America's number one personnel specialist, scowled at the pamphlet on his desk. Secret, it said in big red letters across the top and bottom. Special instructions for Operation Space Case, said the smaller letters across the middle of the top sheet. Now I ask you, Dwindle, Jones said to his clerkish aide, where in this world full of specialists am I going to find someone with a well-rounded education, much less one who will take a chance on a flyer like this? Gosh, Mr. Jones, I wouldn't know, Dwindle blinked. Have you tried looking through your files? Have I tried looking through my files, Jones sighed, looking at the ceiling light. Dwindle, my files include every gainfully employed person in the United States of America and its possessions, millions of them. One doesn't just browse through the files looking for things. Oh, Dwindle said, I'm kind of new at this specialty, he explained. Yes, Dwindle. However, Jones continued, one does make IBM runouts to find things. Hey, that's great, Dwindle said, brightening. Why don't you try making an IBM runout? I did, Dwindle. Please let me finish. Our instructions call for finding a person with a well-rounded education. More specifically, a person who is capable of intelligently discussing and explaining some two dozen major fields of knowledge. Plus, of course, at least a passing acquaintance with some one or two hundred minor fields of knowledge. So I set mathematics into the IBM sorter. Mathematics is one of the major fields of knowledge, you see. Yeah, Dwindle acknowledged. So, I took the few million mathematicians cards which I got. Good mathematicians and bad mathematicians, but at least people who can get their decimals in the right place. 
I set the IBM sorter for biology and ran the mathematician's cards through, so I got several thousand mathematician biologists. That's pretty sharp, Dwindle exclaimed with a twinkle. Who ever thought of that? Please, Dwindle, Jones moaned, pressing his palms to his eyes. Next, I sorted according to geology. Three hundred cards came through. Three hundred people in America who know their math, biology, and geology. That doesn't sound like so many to me, Dwindle said hesitantly, as if wondering what there was to get excited about. And of those three hundred, do you know how many understand, even vaguely, electronics? Twelve. And of those twelve, guess how many have an adequate background in history and anthropology? Much less an understanding of eighteen other fields? Not very many, I'll bet, Dwindle replied smartly. None. Not even one. I tried running the cards through in every order imaginable. We've bred a race of specialists, and there's not a truly educated man among us. Say, you know what I bet? Even if you did find a guy like what all you said? Go ahead, Dwindle. I bet he wouldn't even go up there to Ganymede. I sure wouldn't. I'd be scared to death, Dwindle chattered, waving his finger. How's he gonna get back, even if he gets there okay? Couldn't anyone fool me with a bunch of pretty talk? I know the government doesn't have a rocket that could take off again after it got there. Gotta have launching pads and computers and all that stuff. Government ever think about that? Jones held his head in anguish. Dwindle, why don't you be a good boy and run along to the snack bar for a coffee break and bring me some aspirin when you get back. Freddy the Fish, Willie, and Oscar Frank were occupying the same bench, a comradeship made necessary by the overpopulation of the park on such a glorious day. Oscar was surveying the passing girls and scouting for worthwhile cigarette stubs. Willie was admiring a hovering beetle's power of flight, and Freddy was reading a discarded copy of Scientific American. The beetle landed on Willie's sleeve and promptly located a gaping tear in the fabric through which bare arms showed. Willie raised his other hand menacingly. Don't, Freddy barked, causing Willie to jump with enough force to dislodge the beetle. Aw, oh, Freddy, Willie whined. Why didn't you let me kill it? What good's a stupid bug? That would have been a rather unfortunate kill, Willie, by your bare hand on your bare arm. You must learn to be cognizant of our insect friends and insect enemies. So what's he, poison or something? Unpleasant at least, Freddy said. That was a blister beetle. Smash it on your arm and you'll grow a nice welt. A member of the Meloidae family. You mean bugs have families and all, too? Willie asked. Beetle families are groupings of similar species of insects, Freddy explained, not actually kinfolk. For instance, this beetle is related to the Litta vesicatoria of southern Europe, more commonly known as the... Freddy glanced out of the corner of his eye at Oscar, hoping to shield the next bit of information from his perverted brain, and whispered the name. Willie's eyes widened. Hey, Oscar, he hollered, jumping up. You hear what Freddy said? That bug I almost swatted's practically a Spanish fly. Which way'd he go? Oscar squeaked, allowing his collection of stubs to scatter as he hopped around, looking on and under and behind the bench for the escaping insect. Hold it, hold it, Freddy commanded, trying to restore order. I said it's like it, not is it? It doesn't have what it takes, so skip it, huh? Willie and Oscar sat down again. Freddy, Willie sighed with adoration, how'd you ever get so smart? I mean, being a bum and all. I keep telling you guys, I went to nothing but the finest universities. Well, except toward the end, when I was getting desperate. I guess I wasn't so choosy. Aw, oh, go on now, Freddy. College has cost money, and you're as poor as the rest of us, bumming for a cup of coffee and all the time talking about Yale and Oxford and Harvard. 
What would you say, Willie, if I told you that once I belonged to the richest family in Mississippi? I'd say Mississippi was a pretty poor state, Willie said, and Oscar giggled. I was once Frederick Van Smelt, spoiled son of the wealthy shrimp and oyster scion. And there's nothing as bad, my father said, as spoiled smelt. He disowned me, of course. I owned six Cadillacs, one right after the other. I wrecked them all. I traveled all over the world and probably counteracted a billion dollars worth of foreign aid. I was kicked out of the best schools in the world. How come if you're so smart you flunked out of all them schools? Oscar asked. Me? Flunked out? I never made less than an A in any course I took during my eight years at war with college. I was expelled from nine schools and barely escaped the highway patrol when I was bootlegging at Oklahoma University. Freddy, Willie said, you're lying like a dog, but you make it sound surreal. Jones squirmed uncomfortably in his seat in the briefing room, phrasing and rephrasing his thoughts. It seemed that no matter which arrangement of words he chose, it was still going to be obvious that he'd flopped. He re-examined his fingernails and selected one which was still long enough to chew. General Marcher concluded his current appraisal of the situation and began calling on the various individuals with whom certain phases of Operation Space Case had been entrusted. Jones groaned as each arose and gave favorable progress reports. The pod is completed and has been tested, sir. It will by no means be a plush, but it will be sufficiently comfortable even for the long voyage to Ganymede. The guidance system is perfected to the extent that we need. There are no further deceleration problems to be solved. The crash program has been approved for the two-way rocket. It is on the drawing board and current estimates are that the envoy can be brought back in three years. Ganymede has replied to our last message. A suitable artificial environment will be available for the envoy. Personnel Specialist Jones. Carlton gave his chin a final sweaty rub and slowly rose to his feet. General Marcher, sir, he choked. I'm, we're experiencing a little difficulty in finding a volunteer so far. Negative perspiration on that count, Jones, the project officer interrupted. The draft has never been abolished. We can grab anyone you put your finger on. Now, who will it be? Sir, it doesn't seem to be that so much as, well, sir, has any consideration been given to perhaps sending a delegation rather than a single envoy? The general smiled broadly. Now that is more like it. I take it you mean you have a number of equally qualified persons who have expressed an intense desire to go to Ganymede, and there is no way to impartially select one of these men over the others? This is commendable. However, our space limitation clearly precludes sending more than one person. I'm afraid you will just have to make your choice from a hat. Jones turned a trifle redder. That's not exactly the problem either, sir. The general's smile wilted and became a frozen frown. Just exactly what are you trying to say, Jones? There's no one who can meet the qualifications, sir, Jones said, feeling sick to his stomach. Are you telling me that in the entire United States there is not one person who has a basic understanding of the 24 major fields? I'm afraid that's right, sir. See me after the briefing, Jones. I'm certain that the foremost personnel specialist in the United States must have some further ideas on this matter. Jones sank slowly back into his seat and covered his face with his hands. I'm a goner, he whispered to himself. Jones, you can be replaced. Dwindle, sitting on his left, suddenly punched him vigorously in the ribs. Say, Mr. Jones, he rattled, I just thought of a great idea. Tell it to the general, Jones moaned. 
Maybe then he'll realize what a handicap I've been working under. Hiya, Freddy, Willie said, sitting down on the bench, helping himself to some peanuts. Working a crossword puzzle? Freddy pocketed his pencil stub and laid aside the newspaper. No, not this time. Just playing around with one of those we're looking for bright young men ads. Freddy, you ain't thinking of getting a job. Nothing like that, Freddy laughed. Just exercising my mind. Filling out one of those little tests they always have. Helps keep a fellow sharp, you know. Yeah, I seen the kind. Like what has pictures and you're supposed to find things wrong in the picture, like dames with beard and dogs with six feet? Kinda like that. Only this one's all written and is a little tougher. You're supposed to send the answers in and whoever has good answers gets to take a tougher test, and whoever does good on that test gets the job. Probably selling neckties on the corner or something. No kidding. That's what it says? Just says handsome rewards, but that's probably close to it. You gonna send it in? Willie asked. No, nah, I just fill them out for fun, like I said. Can you imagine me peddling neckties on the corner? Then how do you know if you got the right answers? Hell, I know the answers, Freddy bragged. Like I said, this is just exercise, mental gymnastics. Like this last one, it was pretty tough compared to most of them. Had some questions about things I hadn't even thought about since college. Things I'd forgotten I knew. What good's an education if you forget what things you know? That's why I never bothered, Willie agreed, because I never could remember things so good. No, Willie, you've got it all wrong. I still know it. I just didn't know I know it. Ah, oh, Freddy, Willie said unhappily. You're pulling my leg again. Suit yourself, Freddy smiled. Hold down the bench for me, okay? I'll be right back. Willie watched Freddy until he went into the little brick building in the center of the park, and then grabbed Freddy's newspaper and scampered over to Oscar's bench. Hey, you know how Freddy's always talking big about how much he knows? Willie said breathlessly. I got an idea how to call his bluff. He filled out one of these tests and says he knows all the answers. Let's send it in and see if he's as smart as he says. Yeah, that's great, Willie. Then Oscar's face darkened. Wonder where we can steal a stamp. That was a pretty good idea of mine about advertising in the paper, wasn't it, Mr. Jones? Dwindle, America's number one personnel specialist, asked his surly assistant. Yes, Dwindle. Jones stared gloomily out the 14th story window into the park, where the local bums were loafing and sleeping and feeding peanuts to the pigeons. He was nauseated with the prospect of having to address his new boss as Mr. Dwindle, and was toying with the idea of abandoning his specialty completely to join the ranks of the happy, carefree unemployed. He watched as two uniformed policemen approached one of the less wholesome-appearing characters. Now I don't suppose I could tolerate being in and out of jail every week on a vagrancy charge, he told himself. But then he smiled bitterly as he thought of the strange parallel between the policeman arresting the bum and other officials elsewhere in the United States tapping respectable citizens on the shoulder at this very moment. Dwindle, do you really think it was wise to issue warrants to arrest all those persons who scored perfect on the first test? How many did you say there were? Only a hundred or so, Dwindle smiled sweetly. And besides, they're not being arrested. General Marcher explained to you that they are being drafted into the service of the government. Honestly, sometimes I think you worry too much. Jones turned back to the window, brooding over Dwindle's transformation. Maybe so, he sighed, watching the newly arrested vagrant pointing an accusing finger toward one of the other bums. Willie strained and twisted, trying to reclaim his arm from the policeman's grip. 
honest, you guys. I didn't know it was against the law. I figured it was against the rules, maybe, to send in somebody else's answers. But we was only making a joke, Oscar and me. Oscar's the one who actually put it in the mailbox and stole the stamp. I bet he's the one you're after. Now calm down, Willie, the beefy policeman coaxed. No one's broken any law. Nobody's under arrest. We just want to chat a minute with whoever it was filled out that test. Yeah, Willie, the second policeman broke in. If you didn't do it, and I believe you when you say you didn't, then who did? What's it to you? Willie asked, his mouth twitching nervously. The first policeman glanced at the second and then back at Willie. Well, it's like this, Willie, he said. Whoever filled out those answers got every one of them right. The people who run the contest want to meet the guy, you see, and they asked us to help find him because we know you people better than anyone else does, see? That's all. Yeah, said the second, that's all. Now who did it? Willie stood with his jaw drooping for a moment. You mean he got every last one of them right? He asked. Freddy was always bragging about his brains, but me and Oscar figured he was making most of it up. Freddy who? Freddy the fish, you mean? Yeah, Freddy. Willie perked up and turned toward Freddy's bench. Hey, Freddy, you know that test you took in the newspaper that you didn't know I sent in? You won the contest or something? Hey, that's great! Jones and Dwindle watched the draftees file into the examination room. I still don't see how this is going to solve the problem, Jones frowned. I believe it will, Dwindle contradicted him. Specialists in each of the major fields have been consulted and each provided 50 questions. The hardest questions they could think up, I imagine. No, not at all. The purpose is to provide comprehensive coverage of each field, and each question is of the type that, if the examinee knows the answer, it can reasonably be assumed that he knows quite a bit in that particular phase of the field. For instance, if he knows what enzyme is associated with the stomach, he probably knows what enzyme is associated with the liver. I know one big problem you're going to run into, Jones sulked. Just like the IBM cards, you're going to find one guy who clobbers the electronics part of the test but completely busts out in history and everything else. I don't think so, Dwindle said. The preliminary test will have taken care of that. It was designed so that, in order to answer every question right, a person would have to have at least a rudimentary knowledge of all 24 major fields. As Jones was considering whether it would be better to slit his own throat or dwindles, General Marcher entered the room and approached. Excellent, excellent, the General declared. A very distinguished looking group you've assembled here, Dwindle. Hello, Jones. Yes, sir, Dwindle said with the possible exception of the seedy chap in the rear. Jones looked to the rear of the room and his eyes bugged. Freddy the fish, clean-shaven but tattered, was alternately wetting the pencil lead in his mouth and eating peanuts. That's the bum who feeds sparrows in the park, Jones gasped. How did he get out of jail so quick? I saw a couple of policemen haul him off just a day or so ago. This is where they hauled him to, General Marcher said. It just so happens that he answered every question right on the preliminary examination. He says his name's Freddie Smith, although I doubt that he could prove it. He says he never had a father, Dwindle added. Says his family was too poor. Jones stared at General Marcher, then stared at Dwindle, then turned and stared at Freddie the Fish, who had just left his seat and was ambling toward the trio. Looks like he's throwing in the towel, Jones said happily. He's bringing his paper with him. Maybe he just wants clarification on a question, Dwindle said. I'm all done, Freddy said. Who gets this? Go ahead, Dwindle, Carlton Jones smirked. Grade the man's paper. He's all done. Dwindle smiled uncertainly. You're allowed all the time you need, Mr. Smith. Oh, that's okay. I'm done. Dwindle produced his red pencil and the answer sheet, which had 1,200 small circles punched in it. He sat down, placed the key over the test paper, and began searching for white spaces showing through. 
That's the last one, sir, Gwindle said six hours later as he added the 112th graded test to the neat stack at the left of his desk. He stared through the thousand-plus holes in the answer key as if expecting the holes to shift. And still no change in the standings, General Marcher asked again. Mr. Smith still has the best grade, Dwindle answered. The percentages again, the general asked. Overall, 96% for Mr. Smith, Dwindle said for the fourth time. His lowest percentage in any one category was 80%. The next highest score was by Dr. Schmeling, who had 78%, but he failed in six categories. The third highest score was by Dr. Ranson, 76%, failing in seven categories. The fourth highest score was... Enough, enough, General Marcher interrupted. I think we've found our man, don't you, Dwindle? I hope we don't have to use pressure, sir, Dwindle replied. Jones turned from the window, from which he was observing the bums in the park. How can you possibly consider such a thing, he blurted, as to send a penniless, unemployed, dirty, ragged tramp to Ganymede as the United States' number one emissary? Jones, perhaps I'd best clarify a point or two for you, General Marcher said in measured tones. We've been searching the nation over, seeking a man who can fulfill our exacting requirements. We have found that man. There is no doubt in my mind that Mr. Smith possesses the greatest single store of knowledge about this planet and its people. So far as I am concerned, which is considerable, it doesn't matter that this man has chosen the way of a philosopher instead of seeking an occupation. It doesn't matter that he lacks the necessary status to be listed on your IBM cards. It doesn't matter that you failed to find this man because Dwindle succeeded, and it doesn't matter whether I ever see you again. Yes, sir, Jones said and picked up his hat and left. Now, back to the business at hand, Dwindle. You say these prospects don't know the reasons behind the test. That is correct, sir. I feared there might be some temptation for the prospects not to do their best if they knew that success might result in their being removed from the face of the earth. Wise, then I suggest we approach Mr. Smith on the idea cautiously, to determine his sentiments. If he doesn't want to go, of course, we've got to draft him. Freddy cracked the peanut, put half in his mouth, and tossed the other half to the sparrows. I might be going away for a while, Willie, he said, ending a rather long silence. You ain't getting a job, are you, Freddy? Watch your language, Oscar scolded. No, not really a job, at least not the kind you think of. Sort of an all-expense-paid vacation with a change of scenery. You ain't had a run-in with the bulls, have you? The stricken Willie asked. Me? You know better, Willie. Nothing like that. And I'm not even sure the thing will pan out. But you know all those newspaper stories about the message from another planet? Yeah, yeah, you read it to me, Willie jabbered excitedly. And that test I took that you sent in and the fellows talked to me about? Yeah, say, I hope that didn't make you trouble, Freddy, cause me and Oscar was just kinda joking, see, and it's okay, Willie. Well, one of the fellows I talked to was General Marcher, who's been mentioned in the newspaper stories in connection with, here, Willie, take these, he interrupted himself when he saw the two men approaching. See that new guy at the bench over yonder? Give him these peanuts. I think he'd like to feed my sparrows while I'm gone. Name's Jones, and he'll probably be around for a spell. Freddy stood up to greet the two arrivals. Hello, General, he said, tipping his battered cap. It's about the trip to Ganymede, I suppose? End of Master of None by Lloyd Neal Gable Recording by Dan Wiley Sears
Wild by M. A. Cummings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. No Pets Allowed by M. A. Cummings. I can't tell anyone about it. In the first place, they'd never believe me, and if they did, I'd probably be punished for having her because we aren't allowed to have pets of any kind. It wouldn't have happened if they hadn't sent me way out there to work. But you see, there are so many things I can't do. I remember the day that Chief of Vocation took me before the Council. I've tried him on a dozen things, he reported. People always talk about me as if I can't understand what they mean, but I'm really not that dumb. There doesn't seem to be a thing he can do, the chief went on. Actually, his intelligence seems to be no greater than that which we believe our ancestors had back in the twentieth century. As bad as that, observed one of the council members. You do have a problem. But we must find something for him to do, said another. We can't have an idle person in the state. It's unthinkable. But what? asked the chief. He's utterly incapable of running any of the machines. I've tried to teach him. The only things he can do are already being done much better by robots. There was a long silence broken at last by one little old council member. I have it, he cried. The very thing. We'll make him guard of the treasure. But there's no need of a guard. No one will touch the treasure without permission. We haven't had a dishonest person in the state for more than three thousand years. That's it exactly. There aren't any dishonest people, so there won't be anything for him to do. But we will have solved the problem of his idleness. It might be a solution, said the chief. At least a temporary one. I suppose we will have to find something else later on, but this will give us time to look for something. So I became guard of the treasure, with a badge, and nothing to do unless you count watching the key. The gates were kept locked, just as they were in the old days, but the large key hung beside them. Of course, no one wanted to bother carrying it around. It was too heavy. The only ones who ever used it anyway were members of the Council. As the man said, we haven't had a dishonest person in the State for thousands of years. Even I know that much. Of course, this left me with lots of time on my hands. That's how I happened to get her in the first place. I'd always wanted one, but pets were forbidden. Busy people didn't have time for them, so I knew I was breaking the law, but I figured that no one would ever find out. First I fixed a place for her, and made a brush screen so that she couldn't be seen by anyone coming to the gates. Then one night I sneaked into the forest and got her. It wasn't so lonely after that. Now I had something to talk to. She was small when I got her. It would be too dangerous to go near a full-grown one. But she grew rapidly. That was because I caught small animals and brought them to her. Not having to depend on what she could catch, she grew almost twice as fast as usual and was so sleek and pretty. Really, she was a pet to be proud of. I don't know how I could have stood the four months there alone if I hadn't her to talk to. I don't think she really understood me, but I pretended she did, and that helped. Every three or four weeks three of the council members came to take a part of the treasure or to add to it always three of them. That's why I was so surprised one day to see one man coming by himself. It was Graham, the little old member who had recommended that I be given this job. I was happy to see him, and we talked for a while, mostly about my work and how I liked it. I almost told him about my pet, but I didn't because he might be angry at me for breaking the law. Finally, he asked me to give him the key. I've been sent to get something from the treasure, he explained. I was unhappy to displease him, but I said, I, I can't let you have it. There must be three members. You know that. Of course I know that, but something came up suddenly, so they sent me alone. Now let me have it. I shook my head. That was the one order they had given me, never to give the key to any one person who came along. Grimm became quite angry. You idiot, he shouted. Why do you think I had you put out there? It was so I could get in there and help myself to the treasure. But that would be dishonest, and there are no dishonest people in the state. For three thousand years, I know. His usually kind face had an ugly look I had never seen before. 
but I'm going to get part of that treasure, and it won't do you any good to report it, because no one is going to take the word of a fool like you against a respected council member. They'll think you are the dishonest one. Now give me that key." It's a terrible thing to disobey a council member. But if I obeyed him, I would be disobeying all the others, and that would be worse. No! I shouted. He threw himself upon me. For his size and age he was very strong. Stronger even than I. I fought as hard as I could, but I knew I wouldn't be able to keep him away from the key for very long. And if he took the treasure, I would be blamed. The council would have to think of a new punishment for dishonesty. Whatever it was, it would be terrible indeed. He drew back and rushed at me. Just as he hit me, my foot caught upon a root and I fell. His rush carried him past me and he crashed through the brush screen beside the path. I heard him scream twice and then there was silence. I was bruised all over, but I managed to pull myself up and take away what was left of the screen. There was no sign of Grem, but my beautiful pet was waving her pearl-green feelers as she always did in thanks for a good meal. That's why I can't tell anyone what happened. No one would believe that Grem would be dishonest, and I can't prove it, because she ate the proof. Even if I did tell them, no one is going to believe that a flycatcher plant, even a big one like mine, would actually be able to eat a man. So they think that Grem disappeared, and I'm still out here with her. She's grown so much larger now, and more beautiful than ever. But I hope she hasn't developed a taste for human flesh. Lately, when she stretches out her feelers, it seems that she's trying to reach me. End of No Pets Allowed by M. A. Cummings Now We Are Three by Joe L. Hensley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline Now We Are Three by Joe L. Hensley It didn't matter that he had quit. He was still one of the guilty. He had seen it in her eyes and in the eyes of others. John Rush smoothed the covers over his wife, tucking them in where her restless moving had pulled them away from the mattress. The twins moved beside him, their smooth hands following his in the task, their blind eyes intent on nothingness. "'Thank you,' he said softly to them, knowing they could not hear him, but it made him feel better to talk. His wife, Mary, was quiet. Her breathing was smooth, easy, almost as if she were sleeping. The long sleep. He touched her forehead, but it was cool. The doctor had said it was a miracle she had lived this long. He stood away from the bed for a moment, watching before he went on out to the porch. The twins moved back into what had become a normal position for them in the past months one on each side of the bed, their thin hands holding Mary's tightly, the milky, blind eyes surveying something that could not be seen by his eyes. Sometimes they would stand like this for hours. Outside the evening was cool, the light not quite gone. He sat in the rocking chair and waited for the doctor who had promised to come, and yet might not come. The bitterness came back, the self-hate. He remembered a young man and promises made, but not kept. A girl who had believed and never lost faith even when he had retreated back to the land away from everything. Long, sullen silences, self-pity, brooding over the news stories that got worse and worse. And the children, one born dead, two born deaf and dumb and blind, worse than dead. You helped, he accused himself. You worked for those who set off the bombs and tested and tested, while the cycle went up and up beyond human tolerance. Not the death level, but the level where nothing was sure again, the level that made cancer a thing of epidemic proportions replacing statistically all of the insane multitude of things that man could do to kill himself. 
Even the good things that the atom had brought were destroyed in the panic that ensued. No matter that you quit. You are still one of the guilty. You have seen it hidden in her eyes, and you have seen it in the milky eyes of the twins. Worse than dead. Dusk became night, and finally the doctor came. It had begun to lightning, and a few large drops of rain stroked Rush's cheek. Not a good year for the farming he had retreated to. Not a good year for anything. He stood to greet the doctor and the other man with him. "'Good evening, doctor,' he said. "'Mr. Rush,' the doctor shook hands gingerly. "'I hope you don't mind me bringing someone along. This is Mr. North. He is with the county juvenile office.' The young doctor smiled. "'How is the patient this evening?' "'She is the same,' John Rush said to the doctor. He turned to the other man, keeping his face emotionless, hands at his side. He had expected this for some time. "'I think you will be wanting to look at the twins. They are by her bed.' He opened the door and motioned them in, and then followed. He heard the juvenile man catch his breath a little. The twins were playing again. They had left their vigil at the bedside, and they were moving swiftly around the small living room, their hands and arms and legs moving in some synchronized game that had no meaning. Their movements, quick and sure, their faces showing some intensity, some purpose. They moved with grace, avoiding obstructions. "'I thought these children were blind,' Mr. North said. John smiled a little. "'It is unnerving. I have seen them play like this before, though they have not done so for a long time, since my wife has been ill.' He lowered his head. "'They are blind, deaf, and dumb.' "'How old are they?' Twelve. "'They do not seem to be more than eight, nine at the most.' "'They have been well fed.' John said softly. How about schooling, Mr. Rush? The teaching of handicapped children is not something that can be done by a person untrained in the field. I have three degrees, Mr. North. When my wife became ill and I began to care for them, I taught them to read Braille. They picked it up very quickly, though they showed little continued interest in it. I read a number of books in the field of teaching handicapped children. He let it trail off. Your degrees were in physics, were they not, Mr. Rush? Now the touch of malice came. That is correct. He sat down in one of the wooden chairs. I quit working long before the witch hunts came. I was never indicted. Nevertheless, your degrees are no longer bona fide. All such degrees have been stricken from the records. He looked down, and John saw that his eyes no longer hid the hate. If your wife dies, I doubt that any court would allow you to keep custody of these children. A year before, even six months, and John would not have protested. Now he had to make the effort. They are my children, such as they are and I will fight any attempt to take them from me." The juvenile man smiled without humor. "'My wife and I had a child last year, Mr. Rush. Or perhaps I should say that a child was born to us. I am glad that child was born dead. I think my wife is even glad. Perhaps we should try again. I understand that you and your kind have left us an even chance on a normal birth. He paused for a moment. "'I shall file a petition with the circuit court asking that the juvenile office be appointed guardians of your children, Mr. Rush. I hope you do not choose to resist that petition. Feeling would run pretty high against an ex-physicist who tried to prove he deserved children.' He turned away stiffly and went out the front door. In a little while, Rush heard the car door slam decisively. The doctor was replacing things in the black bag. 
I am sorry, John. He said he was going to come out here anyway, so I invited him to come with me. John nodded. My wife? There is no change. And no chance? There never has been one. The brain tumor is too large and too inaccessible for treatment or surgery. It will be soon now. I am surprised that she has lasted this long. I am prolonging a sure process. He turned away. That's all I can do. Thank you for coming, doctor. I appreciate that. Rush smiled bitterly, unable to stop himself. But aren't you afraid that your other patients will find out? The doctor stopped, his face paling slightly. I took an oath when I graduated from medical school. Sometimes I want to break that oath, but I have not so far. He paused. Try as I may, I cannot blame them for hating you. You know why. Rush wanted to laugh and cry at the same time. Don't you realize that the government that punished the men I worked for for their criminal negligence is the same government that commissioned them to do that work? That officials were warned and rewarned of the things that small increases in radiation might do, and that such things might not show up immediately, and yet they ordered us ahead? He stopped for a moment and put his head down, touching his work-roughened hands to his eyes. They put us in prison for refusing to do a job, or investigated us until no one could or would trust us in civilian jobs. Then, when it was done, they put us in prison, or worse, because the very things we warned them of came true. Perhaps that is true, the doctor said stiffly. But the choice of refusing was still possible. Some of us did refuse to work, Rush said softly. I did, for one. Perhaps you think that we alone will bear the blame. You are wrong. Sooner or later, the stigma will spread to all of the sciences, and to you, doctor. Too many now that you can't save. In a little while, the hate will surround you also. When we are gone, and they must find something new to hate, they will blame you for every malformed baby and every death. You think that one of you will find a cure for this thing. Perhaps you would, if you had a hundred years, or a thousand years, but you haven't. They killed a man on the street in New York the other day because he was wearing a white laboratory smock. What do you wear in your office, doctor? Hate-blind eyes can't tell the difference. Physicist, chemist, doctor. We all look the same to a fool. Even if there were a cancer cure, that is only a part of the problem. There are the babies. Your science cannot cope with the cause. Only mine can do that. The doctor lowered his head and turned away toward the door. There was another thing left to say. If the plumbing went bad in your home, doctor, you would call a plumber, for he would be the one competent to fix it. Rush shook his head slowly. But what happens when there are no plumbers left? The children were by the bed, their hands holding those of the mother. Gently John Rush tugged those hands away and led them toward their own bed. The small hands were cold in his own, and he felt a tiny feeling of revulsion as they tightened. Then the feeling slipped away and was replaced, as if a current had crossed from their hands to his. It was a warm feeling, one that he had known before when they touched him, but for which he had never been able to find mental words to express the sensation. Slowly he helped them undress. When they were in the single bed, he covered them with the top sheet. Their milky eyes surveyed him, unseeing, somehow withdrawn. "'I have not known you well,' he said. "'I left that to her.' I have sat and brooded and buried myself in the earth until it is too late for much else. He touched the small heads. 
I wish you could hear me. I wish... Outside on the road, a truck roared past. Instinctively, he set to hear it. The faces below him did not change. He turned away quickly then and went back out on the porch. He filled his pipe and sat down in the old creaky rocker. A tiny rain had begun to fall hesitantly, as if afraid of striking the sun-hardened ground. Somewhere out there, somewhere hunted but not found, the plumbers gathered. There had been a man. What was his name? Masser, that was it. He had been working on a way to inhibit radioactivity, speed up the half-life, until they had taken the grant away. If a man can do whatever he thinks of, can he undo that which he has done? Masser was the theoreticist. I was the applier, the one who translated equations into cold blueprints. And I was good until they... They had hounded him back to the land when he quit. Others had not been so lucky. When a whole people panic, then an object for their hate must be found. A naming. An immediate object. He remembered the newspaper story that began, They lynched twelve men, twelve ex-men, in New Mexico last night. Have I been wrong? Have I done the right thing? He remembered the tiny hands in his own, the blind eyes. Those hands! Why do they make me feel like— He let his head slide back against the padded top of the rocking chair and fell into a light, uneasy sleep. The dreams came as they had before. Tiny, inhumanly capable hands clutched at him and the sun was hot above. There was a background sound of hydrogen bombs, heard mutely. He looked down at the hands that touched and asked something of his own. The eyes were not milky now. They stared up at him, alert and questioning. What is it you want? The wind tore holes in tiny voices, and there was the sound of laughter, and his wife's eyes were looking into his own, sorry only for him at peace with the rest. And they formed a ring around him, those three, hands caught together, enclosing him. What is it you are saying? It seemed to him that the words would come clear, but the rain came then, great torrents of it, washing all away, all sight and sound. He awoke, and only the rain was true. The tiny rain had increased to a wind-driven downpour, and he was soaked where it had blown under the eaves onto the porch. From inside the house he heard a cry. She was sitting upright in bed. Her eyes were open and full of pain. He went quickly to her and touched her pulse. It was faint and reedy. "'I hurt,' she whispered. Quickly, as the doctor had taught him, he made up a shot of morphine, a full quarter grain, and gave it to her. Her eyes glazed down, but did not close. "'John,' she said softly, "'the children, they talk to—' She twisted on the bed, and he held her with strong arms until the eyes closed again and her breathing became easy. He pushed the ruffled hair back from her eyes and straightened the awry sheets. The vibration of his walking might have wakened the twins. He tiptoed to their bed, for they refused to be parted, even in sleep. For a second he thought that the small nightlight had tricked him by shadows on shadows. He reached down to touch. They were gone. He fought down sudden panic. Where can two children, deaf and dumb and blind, go in the middle of the night? Not far. He opened the door to the kitchen, hand-hunted for the hanging light. They were not there. Nor were they on the small back porch. The panic passed critical mass, exploded out of control. 
He lurched back into the combination living room bedroom. He looked under all of the beds and into the small closet, everywhere the two children might conceal themselves. Outside, the rain had increased. He peered out into the lightning night. A truck horn blew ominously far down the road. The road? He slogged through the mud, instantly soaking as soon as he was out of shelter, not knowing or caring. Through the front yard, out to the road. He could see the lights of the truck coming from far away, two tiny points in the darkness, but no twins. He waited helplessly while the truck rushed past, its headlights cutting holes in the darkness, fearing those lights would outline something that he had not seen, but there was nothing. For another eternity he hunted the muddy fields, the small barn and outbuildings. The clutch of fear made him shout their names, though he knew they could not hear. And then, suddenly, all fear was gone, like a summer squall near the sea, with the sun close behind. It was as if their hands had reached out and touched him, and brought the strange feeling again. "'They are in the house,' he said aloud, and knew he was right. He took time to discard muddy shoes on the porch before he opened the door. And they were there, by the mother's bed, hands clasped over hers. He felt a tiny chill. Their eyes were watching the door as he opened it, their faces set to receive some stimuli, already set, as if they had known he was coming. Mary was breathing softly. On her face all trace of pain had disappeared, and now there was the tiny smile that had been hers long ago. Her breathing was even, but light as forgotten conversation. Gently he tried to pry their resisting hands away from hers. The hands fought back with a terrible strength beyond normality. By sheer greater force he tore one of the twins away. It was like releasing a bomb. Sudden pain stabbed through his body. The twin struggled in his arms the small hands reaching blindly out for the thing they had lost. And Mary's eyes opened, and all of the uncontrolled pain came back into those eyes. Her body writhed on the bed, tearing the coverings away. The twins squirmed away from his slackening hold, and once again caught at the hands of the mother. All struggle ceased. Mary's eyes shut again, the plain lines smoothed themselves, the tiny smile flowered. He reached out and touched the small hands on each side of the mother, and the feeling for which there were no words came through more strongly than ever before. Tiny voices tried to whisper within the corners of his mind, partially blotted, sometimes heard. The real things, the things of hate and fear and despair, retreated beyond the bugle call that sounded somewhere. "'She will die,' the voice said, one voice for two. "'This part of her will die.' And then her voice came, as it had been once before when all the world was young. "'You must not be afraid, John. I have known for a long time, for they were a part of me, and you could not know for your mind was hiding and alone. I have seen." He cried out and pulled his hands away. Sound died. The room was normal again. The milky white eyes surveyed him. The hands remained locked securely over those of the mother. The thin, carven features of the children were emotionless, waiting. He strove for rational meaning within his brain. These are my sons. They cannot see or hear or speak. They are identical twins, born with those defects. Take two children, blind them, make them deaf to all sound, cut away their voices. They are identical twins, facing the same environment, sharing the same heredity of blasted chromosomes. They will have intelligence and curiosity that increases as they mature. 
They will not be blinded by the senses, the easy way. The first thing they will discover is each other. What else might they then discover? It has been said that when sight is lost, the sense of touch and hearing increased to almost unbelievable acuteness. Rush knew that. The blind often also develop a sense almost like radar, which allows them to perceive an object ahead of them and gives them the ability to follow twisting paths. Take one child and put him under the disability that the twins were born with. As intelligence grows, so does single bewilderment. The world is a puzzling and bewildering place. Braille is a great discovery, a way to communicate with the unknown that lies beyond. But the twins had shown almost no interest in Braille. He reached back down for the tiny hands. Yes, we can communicate, the single voice that spoke for two said. We have tried with you before, but we could not break through. Your mind speaks in a language we do not understand, in figures and equations that are not real to us. Those things lie all through your mind. On the surface we have sensed only your pity for us and your hate for the shadowy ones around you, the ones we do not know. It was a wall we could not climb. She is different. A part of her will go with us, the voice said. There is another place that touches this one, which we perceive and know more fully than this one. The voice died away, and brief pictures of a land of other dimensions beyond sight flashed in his brain. He had seen them before imperfectly in the disquieting dreams. She must go with us, for she can no longer exist here the voice said softly. Perhaps there are others like us to come. We do not yet know what we are or whether there will be others like us. But we must go now, before we were ready, because of her. The mother's voice came. You must go too. There is nothing here for you but sorrow. They will take you, John. A softness touched at him. Please, John. The longing was a thing of fire. To cast off the world that had already given him all of the hate and fear that he could stand, that had made him worse than a coward. To go with her. But she no longer needed him. She was complete, as they were, only necessary to themselves. He could not go. During the long night he kept the vigil by the bedside, long after any need to keep it. The twins were gone, and she with them. He could not cry, for all tears seemed useless. He said a small prayer, something he had not done in years, over the cold thing left behind. The rain had ceased outside. Somewhere out there in his world, there were men trying to undo the harm that had been done, harm that he had helped to do, then retreated from. He had no right to retreat further. Something spoke a requiem sentence in his consciousness, light as late sunset, only vaguely there. We are here. We will wait for you. Come to us. Come. He wrote a short note for the doctor and the others who had come and hunt and go through the motions that men must live by. Perhaps the doctor might even understand. I have gone plumbing, the note said. End of Now We Are Three by Joe L. Hensley Recording by Roger Moline Rex X Machina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Reynard. 
Rex Ex Machina by Frederick Max The domination of the minds of tractable man is not new. Many men have dreamed of it. Certainly some of them have tried. This man succeeded. One final lesson. A dying man's last letter to his only son that completes the young man's education. My dear son, the doctors have left, and I am told that in a few hours I shall die. In my lifetime the world has progressed from the chaotic turmoil of the early atomic era to the peacefulness and tranquility of our present age, and I die content. For ten years I have instructed you in all that you will need for the future. One final lesson remains to be taught. On the wall of my bedchamber hangs a citation from a grateful government for services too secret to be herein set forth. In past years you have asked me repeatedly about this citation, but each time I have taken pains to avoid the direct answer. Now it is proper that you should know. Forty years ago I was an obscure army captain stationed at the Armed Forces Language School in Monterey, California. I had, at that time, just completed a tour of duty in Korea, a minor skirmish of that era, and despite an excellent reputation for resourcefulness, I had drawn Monterey as my next assignment. An aptitude for foreign languages had led to an instructorship in the Russian department, with additional duties instructing in the Slavic tongues. My life was pleasant and uneventful, and it was with mixed emotions that I received orders to report to Washington for a new duty assignment. The chain of events which precipitated those orders were to change the world. For while you and I were playing on the lawn of our Monterey home, an unknown Hungarian physicist working under Russian supervision had made a startling discovery. Within a matter of days, alarming rumours of his work reached Washington. Our embassies in Moscow and Belgrade reported furious activity in the field of psychic research and large-scale experiments in mass hypnosis. Four of us were selected to investigate the rumours. Before we could commence our undertaking, word reached Washington that the rumours were now actualities. A device capable of the mass hypnosis of great segments of the world's population was rapidly reaching perfection. After three months of intensive grooming in the fields of physics and psychology, we four agents set out individually with orders to track down and destroy both the scientist and his machine. I never saw the other three again. During the three months of schooling, other members of our vast intelligence organisation had been engaged in laying the groundwork for our efforts. In December 1955, I slipped into Russia and took the place of a government official who felt that Western civilization offered greater reimbursement than Soviet communism. I entered into my new role with trepidation, but my fears were unfounded. Thanks to a remarkable resemblance which was the original reason for my selection, and also due to a most thorough briefing, I found myself making the substitution with ease. I pride myself on the fact that by diligent application I was able to increase my worth to the Russian government to the extent that I was shortly able to secure my transfer to the psychological warfare section of the secret police. From there it was a simple procedure to have myself assigned to what was known as Project Parchak. The device was in its final stage of development. Only the problem of increasing its effective range remained to be solved. Three weeks after my assignment to the project, its successful conclusion was accomplished. In June 1956, the Russian government ordered me to a small house on the outskirts of Bralia, Hungary, where I was to attend a private showing of the device. By design, I arrived one day early, 
and made my way to the laboratory immediately. Dr. Michael Parchak, the inventor, stood facing me as I entered. On a table between us lay a small, complicated mechanism resembling a radio transmitter. But it was infinitely more than that. The device was a thought generator, capable of hypnotizing every thinking creature on the face of the earth. The power of infinite goodness, or evil, which the machine embodied, was terrifying to consider. I listened to Parchak's boasting with revulsion. Although he had the ability to work for the ultimate good of mankind, this creature intended, instead, to use his newly found power for selfish aggrandizement. I drew him out, let him explain the inner workings of his device, and killed him. My orders were to destroy the machine. I disobeyed them. Utilizing the machine to make good my escape, I left Hungary and returned to the United States. The citation which you have seen was only one of the many honors which were bestowed upon me. A few weeks later, I resigned my commission and retired to a country hideaway to experiment further with the device I was supposed to have destroyed. The peace and tranquility in which we of the earth now live marked the successful culmination of my experiments. You will find the machine walled up in the north alcove of my bedchamber. Your education is now complete, my son. Use it well. Be kind to our slave peoples. The world is yours. Your affectionate father, Francis I, Emperor of the Earth. End of Rex Ex Machina by Frederick Max Read by Reynard Transmutation of Muddles This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times A Transmutation of Muddles by Horace Brown Fife The rugged little stellar scout ship flared down to the surface of Kappa Orionis Seven about a mile from the aboriginal village. The pilot, Lieutenant Eric Harohiku, scorched an open field, but pointed out to Lewis Maine that he had been careful to disturb neither woodland nor shoreline. The Kappans are touchy about those, Judge, he explained. They fish a lot, as you'd guess from all these shallow seas, and they pick fruit in the forests, but they don't farm much. No use provoking trouble, Maine approved. It's a long way from Rigel. It's a longer way from Saul, said the pilot. Don't I know it, boy. If it weren't, I'd be just another retired space captain, quietly struggling with my ranch on Rigel 9. As it is, to get the grant, I had to remain on call as an arbitrator. Somebody has to settle these things, said Haruhiko. There's not much law way out here, except what the Space Force can apply. Well, if you'll excuse me, sir, I'll have them get out the helicopter and take us over to the village. Let me see that last message again, before you go, Main requested. The pilot extracted a sheet from his clipboard and handed it to Main as he left. Main studied the text with little pleasure. Terran Space Force headquarters on Rigel nine, wished to inform him that the long-awaited envoy from Terra to Kappa, Orionis, seven, not only had arrived, but had departed two days behind Maine. It was hoped, the communication continued, that nothing would interfere with the desired objective of coming to some friendly agreement with the Kappans that would permit Terran use of the planet as a base for spaceships. The envoy, of course, was prepared to offer trade inducements and various other forms of help to the semi-civilized natives. 
Maine was requested to lay whatever groundwork he could. In my spare time, no doubt, he reflected, I'm to settle this silly business any way at all, as long as the natives get their way. But has anybody told the government about insurance companies? If it costs money or a lawsuit, will they back me up? He felt himself to be in a ridiculous dilemma. The Kappans were reported to have seized a Terran spaceship as it landed to trade. Naturally, the captain had squawked for help. He claimed he had crashed. His insurance company thought otherwise. The Kappans seemed to have some entirely different idea in mind. Maine had been summoned into action to render a decision after the rough and ready system of these settlements on the surface of Terra's sphere of explored space. Regretfully, he made his way now to the cubbyhole allowed him on the cramped scout, where he changed to a more formal tunic of bright blue he hoped would look impressive to native eyes. By the time he was ready, the helicopter was waiting. He and Harahiku entered, and the crewmen at the controls took off for the scene of the dispute. Arriving over the village, they hovered a few minutes while Haruhiku studied the lay of the land. The lieutenant had been to this world before, long enough to pick up some of the language and customs, so Maine was content to follow his advice about landing a little way off from a spaceship that towered outside the village. They came down about a hundred yards away, between a rutted sort of road and a long hut covered by a curved, thatched roof. They're expecting us, said Haruhiku, gesturing at the group before the hut. It consisted of half a dozen humans and several of the Kappan natives. The latter, naturally, caught Maine's eye first. The most imposing individual among them stood about five feet tall. The planet being of about the same mass as Terra, the Kappan probably weighed over 250 pounds. He was a rugged biped with something saurian in his ancestry, for his skin was scaled, and bony plates grew into a low crown upon his long skull. His arms and legs were heavy and bowed, with joints obscured by thick muscles and loose skin. Maine was struck by the fancy that the Kappan's color, a blend of brown and olive, was that of a small dragon who had achieved a good suntan. A yellow kilt was the main article of attire, although he wore a few decorations of polished bone. One of the Terrans stepped forward. He wore a semi-military uniform. "'I suppose you're Louis Maine,' he asked. "'Right,' answered Maine. "'You would be Captain Voorhis of the Jemsbok?' "'Check. This here is Emok. He's more or less chief of the village, or tribe, or whatever you want to call it. Maine found his gaze sinking into cat-like slits of jet and a pair of huge orange eyes shaded by massive brow ridges. The native made some statements in a clicking language that had a harsh, choppy rhythm. He welcomes you to Kappa, Haruhiku interpreted. He hopes the gods will not be displeased. What a warm welcome! commented Maine. Have you been getting along that well, Captain Voorhees? Just about, said the spacer. One of my boys knows a few words. Rest of the time, we make signs. I gotta admit, they ain't been too unfriendly. But they have seized your ship. You're damn right. That insurance guy they sent out don't see it that way, though. Where is this representative of the Belt Insurance Company? asked Maine. Milan? His ship landed over on the other side of the village, about half a mile. He ought to be along soon. Must have seen you land. Maine wondered whether it were necessary to await the arrival of the insurance adjuster before asking any questions. To cover his hesitation, he turned to take his first good look at the hull of the Jemsbok. What did they think they're doing? he demanded, staring. The Jemsbok was or had been, an ungraceful, thick starship on the verge of aging into scrap. 
towering here between the village and the huge bluish-green leaves of the Capon forest, she was in the process of being transformed into a planet-bound object of a certain weird grace. A framework was being constructed about the hull by a swarm of natives. They had reached halfway up the ship, which served as a central column. Much of the exterior appeared to be a network of strangely curved sections of wood that had been given a high polish. Main suspected the greenish highlights were reflections of the forest color. "'Bone,' said Voorhees succinctly. "'They collect it from things they catch in the sea. "'Main supports of timber, of course, built to fit the hull. "'The fish here grow very large,' put in Haruhiku. "'If you could call them fish, that is. "'I once saw them butchering what looked more like a dinosaur.' "'Main realized that the bone framework formed a sort of curtain wall.' At the lower levels, some of the natives seemed to be experimenting with a coating of wet leaves, which they were molding to the wall. "'They've soaked them in something they boil out of fish parts,' his pilot explained, like the village roofs. When it dries, it's pretty hard, even waterproof. The stink never dries out. "'But what do they have in their bony little brains?' asked Maine. "'Just what is that mess supposed to be?' A temple, believe it or not, answered Voorhees. They tell me I set her down on land sacred to the great god Meeg. Main looked at Haro Hiku. Oh, come on now. I came all the way from... He stopped as he noticed the pilot's grave expression. Oh, that sort of thing could be serious, I guess. He imagined he had seen the chief, Emak, coming alert at the mention of the local god. Main sighed. It was going to be a long day. He was saved for the time being by a hail from the direction of the village. A procession was approaching along the set of ruts between Main and the ship. The place of honor appeared to be occupied by a two-wheeled cart of crude but massive design. Upon it rode a Kappan driver, two Kappans with spears and the look of official guards, and a Terran with a death grip upon the side railing. A brace of truculent beasts of frighteningly saurian mien shuffled ponderously along in the loose harness. From time to time, one or the other would stumble over a turn in his rut and emit a menacing rumble, as if he suspected his teammate of causing the misstep. Before and behind this conveyance marched a guard of honor of Kappan warriors. The rear contingent kept close to the cart but the advance party had opened a noticeable gap between themselves and the hulking team. The procession halted. The soldier in charge raised his spear in salute to Emak, and the shaken Terran was assisted to dismount. He introduced himself to Maine as Robert Malan. "'Let's go over to the hut they made for us and sit down,' suggested Voorhees. Malan, a tall, gloomy blonde, whose civilian suit seemed a trifle formal for the surroundings, acceded gratefully. He mopped the dust from his long face and watched the cart being turned around. The procession moved off in the direction of the village, the advance guard stepping out especially smartly, and Main began to get his conference arranged. He learned that the evicted crew of the Gemsbach had been living in the hut nearby. Before it stood a long table with benches, all evidently knocked together from recently felled timber. Melon was given credit for this by Voorhis, since before the arrival of the insurance adjuster and his crew, no power tools had been available to the men from the Gemsbach. Main took a place at the end of the table. Some of the Gemsbach's crew came out of the hut to watch. Most of the Kappan warriors attending the chief took up stations between the table and the ship, in a manner suggesting long habit. Main guessed that attempts had been made to re-enter the ship. He put Haruhiku at his right hand to translate, should it be necessary. Melan and Voorhees sat at his left, their backs to the hut. 
To the other side of the table, Emak brought two Kappans, who were explained to Maine as being the tribal high priest Igrilik and Kanox, who represented a sort of district overlord. I meant to land up by their city, Vorhis put in, but we hit some bad winds up in the stratosphere. We got knocked around a bit in the storm, and set down where we could. Well, tell me about the details, said Maine. I want to get this straight from the start, if I can. By the way, Lieutenant Haruhiku, explain to the chief that a special envoy is on the way, that we want his friendship, and that he will be dealt with fairly. He waited out the exchange of choppy speech between the pilot and Emak. He says he is sure he will be fairly dealt with, reported Haruhiku. I wonder what he meant by that, murmured Maine. If we make a deal here, and thereby with his overlord, will that cover enough territory to be official? As much as you can get together anywhere on this world, sir. Maine nodded, then turned to Captain Voorhees. Now about this so-called crash, he prompted. Well, there was this storm, like I said. Trouble was we didn't expect to hit it, and, well, somebody took it in his head to blow some of the fuel tanks for a crash landing. That's why I'm not claiming anything on the fuel, he finished, turning to Malon. We are perfectly willing to pay on that item, replied the insurance man. Anyhow, continued Borges, I sat down here where we saw the open spot, and then, of course, we were stuck with nothing to lift off with. It looked all right. We'd unload our goods, and if the local crowd couldn't use them all, why, they'd pass the rest on at a profit to themselves. So we come out to palaver, and then they won't let us go back in the ship. We were just lucky my comm man had sent out a landing report when it looked like we piled up, or the Space Force patrol never would have heard of us. Was there any trouble? asked Maine. Any unnecessary hostility? Voorhis considered, rubbing the back of his head thoughtfully. Well, I suppose, looking at it their way, they could have been a lot rougher. A couple of punches got thrown, and one of my boys got a spear busted over his head. But mostly they acted, well, maybe more like cops than cannibals. Just enforcing the native laws, eh? Voorhees did not swallow that quite so graciously. He did not know or care what the local laws might be, but he thought it suspicious in the extreme that he should have plopped down exactly upon the spot chosen by the natives for a temple. So do they have to use my ship to hang it on? He finished plaintively. The company is in agreement with you there, Captain, Malin put in. You see, Judge, our point is that nothing is really lost or seriously damaged, neither ship nor cargo. They are merely being withheld from their rightful owner, and we believe that puts the responsibility for recovery upon the Terran government. Captain Voorhees has our entire sympathy. Yeah, said Voorhees, and if I get my head sliced off trying to get at that undamaged cargo, you'll come to my funeral. I'd say it's a loss. Now, gentlemen, interrupted Maine, let me get on with this. Both of you, I'm sure, realize that I'm not a lawyer, in spite of being a special judge. If the colonies way out here had enough lawyers to spare, I certainly wouldn't be sticking my head into this. Nevertheless, any decision I make here will be regarded as legally binding by the government of Rigel IX, so let us remain level-headed. Very well, Judge, said Malin. Here are the figures on— Please round them off, said Maine. If I have to listen to a long list of Cynthic credits, I'll probably go off to see what kind of beer they brew here. You wouldn't like it, muttered Voorhees, staring sourly at the village. No doubt, grinned Maine. Melon swallowed and returned to an inner pocket a sheaf of papers he had withdrawn. Speaking very loosely, he went on, as if hating to do anything loosely. The coverage was about as follows. 
For the Jimsbach herself, two million. But that was really a nominal figure, accorded as a sort of courtesy. Otherwise, at her true worth, the authorities would hardly have permitted Captain Voorhees to take her into space. Get on with it, urged Maine, to forestall any wrangle. Er, yes. Then on the cargo, the purchase cost of two hundred thousand credits. Voorhees visibly flinched and began to acquire a ruddy hue. And finally, on the fuel load, the cost price of three hundred thousand. Of course, Judge, there are detailed clauses as to the normal use of fuel. He was actually insured against defects, premature explosions, accidental loss, etc. Maine did some addition in his head. So your company, he said aloud, is prepared to pay two and a half million for the loss sustained by Captain Voreus. What seems to be wrong with that? Both men began to talk, but Malin, struggling less with temper, got the lead. Actually, he said, we feel liable for only three hundred thousand. Now it will get tough, thought Maine. He silently awaited elucidation. The combined stares of all parties, including the enigmatic glance of Emok, calmed the spluttering Voorhees. Melin continued. In the first place, the true value of the ship, even if we consider her to be incapacitated, which we do not, is only about one hundred and fifty thousand. She's worth more than that as scrap, bellowed Voorhees. No, Captain, just about that. It is exactly how we valued her. Do you have any idea, Judge, of how old that crock is? Let's not go into that just yet, suggested Maine. As to the fuel, said Malin, I am willing, as a gesture of good will, to stick my company's neck out, and mine with it, you may be sure and honor a full claim. Even though he used about half the fuel getting here? asked Maine. We'll ignore that. We admit that he is out of fuel, and we want to— You want to give me a moon and take a star, said Voorhees. Just a minute. Maine held up his hand. That's the ship and the fuel. What about the cargo? Why, as to that, Judge, we do not admit that it is lost. It is right over there, easily accessible. We consider it more the job of the Space Force to restore rightful possession than it is the responsibility of the company to reimburse Captain Voorhees for the inflated value he sets upon it. I begin to see, murmured Maine. You can't stick each other, so you're out to slip me the bill. That aroused a babel of denials. Maine eventually made himself heard and demanded to know how the spacer's evaluation differed from Malin's. Voorhees pulled himself together, glowering at the insurance man. In the first place, he growled, I don't want his lousy payment for fuel. I'd said I'd take the blame for that, and I will. On the ship, well, maybe she ain't worth two million. Maybe she ain't been for a few years now. Malin made a show of counting on his fingers. But they charge me premiums by that figure, and I say they ought to pay by that figure. But can you prove she's a total loss, Captain? asked Maine. Voorhees grimaced and spat upon the ground. Try to get nearer, Judge. You'll get proof fast enough. Well, about the cargo, then. That's where he's gouging me, exploded Voorhees. The idea of using the cost as of loading on Rigel 9. Hell, you know, the margin of profit there is in trading on these new planets. Twenty to one at least. I figured to lift off with four million worth of ores, gems, curios, and whatnot. So your point is that the mere transportation of the goods through space to this planet increased their value. What about that, Mr. Malin? Malin shifted uncomfortably on his bench. Maine would have liked to change his own position, but feared splinters. 
There is an element of truth in that, admitted Malin. Still, it would be rash to expect such a return every time a tramp spaceship lands to swap with some aboriginal easy marks. I suppose, said Maine, that our orange-eyed friends speak no Terran. I hope not, exclaimed Borges. Well, anyway, Mellon said after a startled pause, how can we be expected to pay off on hopes? He wants the paper figure for the ship, but he refuses the paper figure for the cargo. Maine shrugged. He turned to Haruhiku. If Captain Voorhees and Mr. Mellon don't mind, Lieutenant, I'd like to get the chief's view of all this. Ha! grunted Voorhees, clapping both hands to his head. Mellon contented himself with rolling his eyes skyward. With Haruhiku translating, Maine began to get acquainted with the Kappans. The visitor from the neighboring city chose mostly to listen attentively, but Igrilik, the priest, occasionally leaned over to whisper sibilantly into Imak's recessed ear. Maine fancied he saw a resemblance between the two, despite Igrilik's professional trappings. A long robe of rough material that had been dyed in stripes and figures of several crude colors, and a tall cap to which were attached a number of pairs of membranous wings. The first thing that Maine learned was that the Jimsbach was not a spaceship. It was a symbol, a sign sent to the Kappans by the great god Meeg. And why did he send it? asked Maine. He had sent it as a sign that he was impatient with his children. They had vowed him a temple. They had set aside the necessary land, and yet they had not begun the work. Is that why they're all over there, slaving away so feverishly? It was indeed the reason. After all, Meeg was the god of the inner moon, the one that passed so speedily across the sky. If he could guide the stranger's ship directly to his own plot of ground, he might just as easily have caused it to land in the center of the village. They had seen the flames that attended the landing. Could the honored chief from the stars blame them for heeding the warning? I see their point, muttered Maine resignedly. Well, maybe we can talk sense about the cargo. Tell them there was much in the holds that would make their lives richer. Tools, gems, fine cloth. Give them the story, lieutenant. This time, Imak conferred with the high priest. It developed that the cargo was a sacred gift to be used, or not, as the god Meeg might subsequently direct. The chief meant no insult. The Kappans realized that Voorhees and his crew were no demons, but starmen, such as had often brought valuable goods to trade. The Kappans had not sought to harm or sacrifice them, had they? This was because they were both welcome as visitors and respected as instruments of Meeg. Emok wished to be fair. The starmen might think they had lost by the divine mission. Very well. They would be granted land, good land, with forests for hunting and shoreline for fishing. But go near the temple, they should not. Could I get in to inspect the cargo? asked Maine. Haruhiku took this up with the Kappans, who softened, but did not yield. The best I can get, Judge, said the pilot, is that they wish it were possible, but only those who serve the purposes of Meeg may enter. They would look at it that way, sighed Maine. Well, let's leave it at that, until we can think this over some more. It's time for a lunch break, anyway. He and Haruhiku were flown back to the scout ship. Maine brooded silently most of the way. Voorhees thought he was entitled to about six million credits for ship and cargo. Malin thought half a million for the ship and fuel would be stretching it. Maine foresaw that he would have to knock heads. The two of them lunched in the pilot's cabin, with hardly room to drop a spoon. Except for companionship, Maine would as soon have eaten standing in the galley. He considered the vast area of the planet's land surface. 
Would it be wiser for the envoy to land elsewhere? What sort of ties were there between tribes? Loose, the pilot told him. Still, word gets around, with no great mountain or ocean barriers. They've split into groups, but there is a lot of contact. So if the Space Force should seize the Gemsbach, they'll all hear about it. Within a few weeks, sir. That kind of news has wings on any world. I think we could take her for you, but we might do some damage. The size of a scout crew doesn't lend itself to hand-to-hand -to -hand brawls. And if you sling a couple of torpedoes at the Cap'n village, you'll probably wipe it out, said Maine thoughtfully. Give the story a month to spread, and no Terran would be trusted anywhere on the planet. Hmm, hardly practical. There would also be a chance of damaging the Gemsbok. Actually, Eric, I'd hardly care if you blew her into orbit, with Voorhees and Melin riding the fans. But I'm supposed to spread sweetness and light around here, not scraps and parts of spaceships. He gnawed moodily upon a knuckle, but saw no way to escape, putting up some government money. Soaking the company would just make them appeal instead of Voorhees. This Meeg he said to change the subject. How important is he? Harahiku considered a moment before replying. They have a whole mess of gods, like most primitive societies. Meg is pretty important. I think he has special significance to this tribe. You know, like some ancient Terran cities had a special patron. He's the god of that little moon? Maine asked. Oh, more than that, I think. Really the god of speed a message-bearer for the other divinities. There always seems to be one in every primitive mythology. Yes, murmured Maine. Let's see. One parallel would be the ancient Terran Hermes, wouldn't it? Something like that, agreed Harahiku. I'm a little vague on the subject, sir. At least he isn't one of the bloodthirsty ones. That helps, sighed Maine. But not enough. He got a message blank from the pilot. With some labor, he composed a request to Terran headquarters on Rigel 9 for authorization to spend two million credits on goodwill preparations for the Terran Cap'n Treaty Conference. It sounds almost diplomatic, he told himself, before having the message sent. The waiting period that followed was more to be blamed upon headquarters pussyfooting than upon the subspace transmission. When an answer finally came, it required a further exchange of messages. Maine's last communique might have been boiled down to, But I need it! The last reply granted provisional permission to spend the sum mentioned, but gleaming between the lines like the sweep of a revolving beacon was a strong intimation that Maine had better not hope to charge the item to good will. The budget just was not made that way, the hint concluded. It's due to get dark soon, isn't it? he asked Harahiku, crumpling the final message into a side pocket. I don't believe I'll resume the talks till morning. Maybe my head will function again by then. In the morning, one of the scout's crew again took the pilot and Maine to the meeting by helicopter. Maine spent part of the trip mulling over a message Harahiku had received. The spaceship, Diamond Belt, could be expected to arrive in orbit about the planet later the same day, bearing Special Envoy J.P. MacDonald. The captain, having been informed of Harahiku's presence, requested landing advice. I told him what I know, said the pilot. We can give him a beam down, of course, unless you think we should send him somewhere else. Well, let's see how this goes, said Maine. They seem to be waiting for us down there. They landed to find Voorhees, Malin, and the native officialdom gathered at the hut facing the new temple. After exchanging greetings, they sat down at the table as they had the day before. All right, gentlemen, said Maine to the two Terrans. You win. 
The government is going to have to put something in the pot. I want to make it as little as possible, so let us have no more nonsense about the true value of ship or cargo as they stand. They looked startled at his tone. Maine went on before they could recover. The object I have in mind, if it seems at all possible, is to put Captain Voorhees back in business without costing Mr. Malin his job. Now, let's put our heads together on that problem and worry about justifying ourselves later. The most difficult part was to convince Voorhees to surrender his dream of fantastic profits. But sometime before Maine got hoarse, the captain was made to see that he could not have his cake and eat it, too. Malin agreed that he might pay the paper value of the Jumsbach if he could pay likewise for the cargo in which case he would admit a loss. After all, a spaceship anchored by a temple might reasonably be termed unspaceworthy. He would take over the cargo and cut his losses by allowing the government to buy it at two million. You want to come with me the next trip? invited Voorhees when he heard this. If that's how you cut loose, we'll make a fortune. Well, there it is said Mang, straightening up to ease his aching back. He must have been leaning tensely over the table longer than he had thought. The captain gets two and a half million. Mr. Malin gets off with paying only half a million, and you've stuck me for the rest. Congratulations, Judge, said Malin. You now own a ship and cargo which I presume you will present to the captains. How can he? demanded Voorhees. They figure they own it already. We'll worry about that later, said Maine. You will, Voorhees guffawed. I hope you get some credit out of it. Haruhiku interrupted to inform Maine that the Kappans, who had been interested in, if bewildered listeners, had invited the Terrans to a small feast. I translated enough to let them understand there would be no attempt to disturb their temple building, he explained. They now feel they owe us hospitality. Good, that's something, said Mayne. I'll tell you what else will be something, grunted Voorhees. The food. The assemblage repaired to the Cap'n village. The Terrans, though it took some doing, survived the feast. Maine thought it best not to inquire into the nature of the dishes served. Emak was evidently determined to display his village's finest hospitality, so the Terrans even tried the cap and beer. Maine absorbed enough to get used to it. Or did it absorb me, he wondered. Igrelix beginning to look almost human. Eventually carts were brought, and they rode bumpily out to admire progress made on the temple. A fresh breeze helped Maine to remember that it was now late afternoon, and he had yet to settle one matter with Emok. When they arrived at the site, crewmen from the Gemsbach saw fit to take Voorhees in charge and carry him into their hut. Maine sank down at the table outside, watching Malin grope to a place beside him. He noticed that Harahiko's helicopter pilot handed him a message as soon as the lieutenant alighted. That will be from the diamond belt, Main guessed. He eyed Malin with some amusement. The insurance man stared very quietly at the board beneath his elbows. His complexion held a tint of green. Even Emok, plodding ponderously up, lowered himself to a bench with a sigh. The high priest seemed less affected by the celebration, and Main was proud when Harahiko walked over with his normal bland alertness. They're getting near? he asked. Doing breaking circles, reported the pilot. I sent an order for the scout to give them a beam. There may still be time to send them somewhere else. One more try here first, Main decided. Tell Emok we want to straighten out some confusion about Meeg and the cargo. Haruhiku permitted himself a small shrug and translated. Emak aroused himself to a show of interest, while Igrilik 
turned a suspicious orange stare upon Maine. The latter strove to frame in his mind an argument that would strike them as logical. Tell him, he instructed, that we believe this Meeg was known on Terra, but by another name. Then describe the mythical Hermes and see what he says. Haruhiku began a conversation that lasted several minutes. Igrilik, as an authority, obviously felt moved to deliver a lengthy opinion. At last, the pilot turned to Maine. They say we are to be congratulated, he reported. Is that all? Well, they do seem a bit more friendly. I was going to try drawing a picture of that famous statue, with the winged heels and hat, but it would never match their own conception. Igrilik asked if you claim belief in Meeg. Avoid that, said Maine. Now, do they know about ship communications? They are aware that it is done, said Harahiku. After all, they just saw me send a message to the scout over the helicopter screen. Good. Point out to them that the Gemsbok also has such equipment. Haruhiku engaged in another long talk. The cabins began to show signs of uneasiness at the end. They remained silent. And that, therefore, added Maine, the Terran who served this machine should rank in their eyes as a servant of Meeg just as much as Igrilic. The cargo in the ship was no more his than a message belongs to the messenger bearing it. The pilot put this into Cap'n, with gestures. And furthermore, said Maine, before it could be suggested that the owner might be Meeg, what I have arranged here with Melin and Voorhees is that the cargo now belongs to all of the Terran people. Emok began to scowl, an impressive contortion on a broad, olive Cap'n visage. Maine hurried on. This being the case, the Cap'ns have absolutely no right to deny us the privilege of contributing all these goods to the glory of their temple. Oh, boy, grunted Haruhiko. He rattled off the translation. Maine watched it hit home. Igrilic leaned over to peer at him unbelievingly. Emok seemed to have difficulty in focusing his glowing eyes on the Terran. There were, of course, requests for clarification. Maine left the repetitions to the pilot. In the end, Emok arose and embraced him, a startling action that left Maine feeling introspectively of his ribs. Igrilic called out something to the bodyguard attending the chief causing Maine to repress a shudder at the flashing display of big cap and teeth. He assumed that a smile was a humanoid constant. Haruhiku's pilot approached with a new message. Now they have to land near here, in half an hour or less, said the spacer. There's just one more thing, Maine told him. Voorhees is satisfied. Melin, Look, he's gone to sleep on the table. Is relieved. The Cap'ns are friendly, and J.P. MacDonald will be happy when he lands. Now I have to get myself off the hook for two million. He turned to the Gemsbach crewman, loitering before the hut. Who was the communications man? he demanded. A lean, freckled youth with a big nose admitted to the distinction. Maine draped an arm about his shoulders and told him he was back in business. Say to them, he instructed Haruhiku, that if they are to learn how to use the equipment Meeg has provided for their temple, they must not delay one minute in taking our friend here into the ship. Uh, make that temple. He will show them how a spaceship is called down from the skies. Haruhiku gave him a straight-faced glance that was a masked guffaw. He translated, and orders began to be shouted back and forth among the Cap'ns, all the way to the topmost level of the construction. The lieutenant called his pilot. I'll have him flash the scout in order to monitor the Gemsbach and transfer landing control as soon as they hear her on the air, he explained. Maine nodded. He clutched the arm of the Gemsbach operator 
who was being urged away by Igrelik and a group of warrior escorts. "'Just one thing, son,' he shouted over the babble. "'Forget about the ship's call sign. You go on the air calling yourself Kappa Orionis Central Control.' "'Kappa Orionis Central?' repeated the youth distressfully. "'You've got it,' said Maine, and shoved him on his way. He turned to Harahiku. The last thing to do is to send the helicopter for some paint. I don't care if it isn't dry when the diamond belt touches down. I want a sign over the door of this hut. A sign? Make it read Spaceport Number 1. Two million is cheap enough for buying a spaceport already in operation. There won't be any trouble, since the Cap'ns promised the land. Everyone seemed to be running somewhere. Maine wiped his face with a handkerchief and sat down beside Malin, who looked comfortable enough with his head on the table. From inside the hut, Maine could hear snores that must have Voris as a source. The rest of the Gemsbach crewmen had followed the crowd to the control tower that was also a temple. After a while, Harahiku returned and sat down across from Melon. Magnificent, Judge, he said. We might even get away with it. Of course we will, said Maine, gazing at Melon and listening to Voorhees. After all, Hermes was the god of thieves, too. End of a Transmutation of Muddles by Horace Brown Fife. By Harry Harrison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. The Velvet Glove by Harry Harrison. New York was a bad town for robots this year. In fact, all over the country it was bad for robots. John Venix fitted the key into the hotel room door. He had asked for a large room, the largest in the hotel, and paid the desk clerk extra for it. All he could do now was pray that he hadn't been cheated. He didn't dare complain or try to get his money back. He heaved a sigh of relief as the door swung open. It was bigger than he had expected, fully three feet wide by five feet long. There was more than enough room to work in. He would have his leg off in a jiffy, and by morning his limp would be gone. There was the usual adjustable hook on the back wall. He slipped it through the recessed ring in the back of his neck and kicked himself up until his feet hung free of the floor. His legs relaxed with a rattle as he cut off all power from his waist down. The overworked leg motor would have to cool down before he could work on it, plenty of time to skim through the newspaper. With the chronic worry of the unemployed, he snapped it open at the want ads and ran his eye down the Help Wanted Robot column. There was nothing for him under the specialist heading. Even the unskilled labor listings were bare and unpromising. New York was a bad town for robots this year. The want ads were just as depressing as usual, but he could always get a lift from the comic section. He even had a favorite strip, a fact that he scarcely dared mention to himself. Rattly Robot, a dull-witted mechanical clod who was continually falling over himself and getting into trouble. It was a repellent caricature, but could still be very funny. John was just starting to read it when the ceiling light went out. It was 10 p.m., curfew hour for robots. Lights out and lock yourself in until 6 in the morning. Eight hours of boredom and darkness for all except the few night workers. But there were ways of getting around the letter of the law that didn't concern itself with a definition of visible light. Sliding aside some of the shielding around his atomic generator, John turned up the gain. As it began to run a little hot, the heat waves streamed out, visible to him as infrared rays. He finished reading the paper in the warm, clear light of his abdomen. With the thermocouple in the tip of his second finger left hand, he tested the temperature of his leg. It was soon cool enough to work on. 
The waterproof gasket stripped off easily, exposing the power leads, nerve wires, and the weakened knee joint. The wires disconnected, John unscrewed the knee above the joint and carefully placed it on the shelf in front of him. With loving care, he took the replacement part from his hip pouch. It was the product of toil purchased with his savings from three months' employment on the Jersey pig farm. John was standing on one leg testing the knee joint when the ceiling fluorescent flickered and came back on. Five-thirty already. He had just finished in time. A shot of oil on the new bearing completed the job. He stowed away the tools in the pouch and unlocked the door. The unused elevator shaft acted as a waste chute. He slipped his newspaper through a slot in the door as he went by. Keeping close to the wall, he picked his way carefully down the grease-stained stairs. He slowed his pace at the seventeenth floor as two other mechs turned in ahead of him. They were obviously butchers or meat-cutters. Where the right hand should have been on each of them there stuck out a wicked foot-long knife. As they approached the foot of the stairs, they stopped to slip the knives into the plastic sheaths that were bolted to their chest plates. John followed them down the ramp into the lobby. The room was filled to capacity with robots of all sizes, forms, and colors. John Venix's greater height enabled him to see over their heads to the glass doors that opened onto the street. It had rained the night before, and the rising sun drove red glints from the puddles on the sidewalk. Three robots painted snow white to show they were night workers pushed the doors open and came in. No one went out, as the curfew hadn't ended yet. They milled around slowly, talking in low voices. The only human being in the entire lobby was the night clerk dozing behind the counter. The clock over his head said five minutes to six. Shifting his glance from the clock, John became aware of a squat black robot waving to attract his attention. The powerful arms and compact build identified him as a member of the Digger family, one of the most numerous groups. He pushed through the crowd and clapped John on the back with a resounding clang. John Venex! I knew it was you as soon as I saw you sticking up out of the crowd like a green tree trunk. I haven't seen you since the old days on Venus. John didn't need to check the number stamped on the short one's scratched chest plate. Alec Digger had been his only close friend during those thirteen boring years at Orange Sea Camp. A good chess player and a whiz at two-handed handball. They had spent all of their off time together. They shook hands with the extra squeeze that means friendliness. Alec, you beat-up little grease-pot, what brings you to New York? The burning desire to see something besides rain and jungle, if you must know. After you bought out, things got just too damn dull. I began working two shifts a day in that foul diamond mine, and then three a day for the last month to get enough credits to buy my contract and passage back to Earth. I was underground so long that my photo cell on my right eye burned out when the sunlight hit it. He leaned forward with a hoarse, confidential whisper. If you want to know the truth, I had a sixty-carat diamond stuck behind the eye lens. I sold it here on Earth for two hundred credits. Gave me six months of easy living. It's all gone now, so I'm on my way to the employment exchange." His voice boomed loud again. And how about you? John Venix chuckled at his friend's frank approach to life. It's just been the old routine with me, a run of odd jobs, until I got sideswiped by a bus. It fractured my knee bearing. The only job I could get with a bad leg was feeding slop to pigs. Earned enough to fix the knee, and here I am. Alec jerked his thumb at a rust-colored three-foot-tall robot that had come up quietly beside him. If you think you've got trouble, take a look at Dick here. That's no coat of paint on him. Dick Dreyer, meet John Venex, an old buddy of mine. John bent over to shake the little mech's hand. His eye shutters dilated as he realized what he had thought was a coat of paint was a thin layer of rust that coated Dick's metal body. Alec scratched a shiny path in the rust with his fingertip. His voice was suddenly serious. Dick was designed for operation in the Martian desert. It's as dry as a fossil bone there, so his skinflint company cut corners on the stainless steel. When they went bankrupt, he was sold to a firm here in the city. After a while, the rust started to eat in and slow him down. They gave Dick his contract and threw him out. The small robot spoke for the first time, his voice grated and scratched. Nobody will hire me like this, but I can't get repaired until I get a job. 
His arms squeaked and grated as he moved them. I'm going by the robot-free clinic today. They said they might be able to do something. Alec Digger rumbled in his deep chest. Don't put too much faith in those people. They're great at giving out tenth credit oil capsules or a little free wire, but don't depend on them for anything important. It was six now. The robots were pushing through the doors into the silent streets. They joined the crowd moving out, John slowing his stride so his shorter friends could keep pace. Dick Dreyer moved with a jerking, irregular motion, his voice as uneven as the motion of his body. John Venex. I don't recognize your family name. Something to do with Venus, perhaps? Venus is right. Venus experimental. There are only twenty-two of us in the family. We have waterproof, pressure-resistant bodies for working down on the ocean bottom. The basic idea was all right. We did our part, only there wasn't enough money in the channel dredging contract to keep us all working. I bought out my original contract at half price and became a free robot. Dick vibrated his rusted diaphragm. Being free isn't all it should be. I sometimes wish the Robot Equality Act hadn't been passed. I would just love to be owned by a nice rich company with a machine shop and a mountain of replacement parts. You don't really mean that, Dick. Alec Digger clamped a heavy black arm across his shoulders. Things aren't perfect now, we know that, but it's certainly a lot better than the old days. We were just hunks of machinery then, used twenty-four hours a day until we were worn out and then thrown in the junk pile. No thanks. I'll take my chances with things as they are. John and Alec turned into the employment exchange, saying goodbye to Dick, who went on slowly down the street. They pushed up the crowded ramp and joined the line in front of the registration desk. The bulletin board next to the desk held a scattering of white slips announcing job openings. A clerk was pinning up new additions. Venex scanned them with his eyes, stopping at one circled in red. Robots needed in these categories. Apply at once to Hain Jet Limited, 1219 Broadway. Fasten, Flyer, Autumnal, Filmer, Venex. John rapped excitedly on Alec Digger's neck. Look there, a job in my own specialty. I can get my old pay rate. See you back at the hotel tonight, and good luck in your job hunting. Alec waved goodbye. Let's hope the job's as good as you think. I never trust those things until I have my credits in my hand. John walked quickly from the employment exchange, his long legs eating up the blocks. Good old Alec. He didn't believe in anything he couldn't touch. Perhaps he was right, but why try to be unhappy? The world wasn't too bad this morning. His leg worked fine, prospects of a good job. He hadn't felt this cheerful since the day he was activated. Turning the corner at a brisk pace, he collided with a man coming from the opposite direction. John had stopped on the instant, but there wasn't time to jump aside. The obese individual jarred against him and fell to the ground. From the height of elation to the depths of despair in an instant, he had injured a human being. He bent to help the man to his feet, but the other would have none of that. He evaded the friendly hand and screeched in a high-pitched voice, Officer! Officer! Police! Help! I've been attacked by a, a, a mad robot! Help!" A crowd was gathering, staying at a respectful distance, but making an angry muttering noise. John stood motionless, his head reeling at the enormity of what he had done. A policeman pushed his way through the crowd. Seize him, officer! Shoot him down! He struck me! Almost killed me! The man shook with rage, his words thickening to a senseless babble. The policeman had his seventy-five recoilless revolver out and pressed against John's side. This man has charged you with a serious crime, Grease Can. I'm taking you into the station to talk about it. He looked around nervously, waving his gun to open a path through the tightly packed crowd. They moved back grudgingly with murmurs of disapproval. John's thoughts swirled in tight circles. How did a catastrophe like this happen? Where was it going to end? He didn't dare tell the truth. That would mean he was calling the man a liar. There had been six robots power-lined in the city since the first of the year. If he dared speak in his own defense, there would be a jumper to the street lighting circuit and a seventh burnt-out hulk in the police morgue. A feeling of resignation swept through him. There was no way out. 
If the man pressed charges it would mean a term of penal servitude, though it looked now as if he would never live to reach the court. The papers had been whipping up a lot of anti roby feeling. You could feel it behind the angry voices, see it in the narrowed eyes and clenched fists. The crowd was slowly changing into a mob. A mindless mob as yet, but capable of turning on him at any moment. What's going on here? It was a booming voice with a quality that dragged at the attention of the crowd. A giant cross-continent freighter was parked at the curb. The driver swung down from the cab and pushed his way through the people. The policeman shifted his gun as the man strode up to him. That's my robot you got there, Jack. Don't put any holes in him. He turned on the man who had been shouting accusations. Fatty here is the world's biggest liar. The robot was standing here waiting for me to park the truck. Fatty must be as blind as he is stupid. I saw the whole thing. He knocks himself down walking into the Roby, then starts hollering for the cops. The other man could take no more. His face crimson with anger, he rushed toward the trucker, his fists swinging in ungainly circles. They never landed. The truck driver put a meaty hand on the other's face and seated him on the sidewalk for the second time. The onlookers roared with laughter. The power lining and the robot were forgotten. The fight was between two men now. The original cause had slipped from their minds. Even the policeman allowed himself a small smile as he holstered his gun and stepped forward to separate the men. The trucker turned towards John with a scowl. Come on, you, aboard the truck. You've caused me enough trouble for one day. What a junk can! The crowd chuckled as he pushed John ahead of him into the truck and slammed the door behind them. Jamming the starter with his thumb, he gunned the thunderous diesels into life and pulled out into the traffic. John moved his jaw, but there were no words to come out. Why had this total stranger helped him? What could he say to show his appreciation? He knew that all humans weren't Roby-haters. Why, it was even rumored that some humans treated robots as equals instead of machines. The driver must be one of these mythical individuals. There was no other way to explain his actions. Driving carefully with one hand, the man reached up behind the dash and drew out a thin plasticoid booklet. He handed it to John, who quickly scanned the title. Robot Slaves in a World Economy by Philpot Asimov II If you're caught reading that thing, they'll execute you on the spot. Better stick it between the insulation on your generator. You can always burn it if you're picked up. Read it when you're alone. It's got a lot of things in it that you know nothing about. Robots aren't really inferior to humans. In fact, they're superior in most things. There is even a little history in there to show that robots aren't the first ones to be treated as second-class citizens. You may find it a little hard to believe, but human beings once treated each other just the way they treat robots now. That's one of the reasons I'm active in this movement. Sort of like the fellow who was burned helping others stay away from the fire. He smiled a warm, friendly smile in John's direction, the whiteness of his teeth standing out against the rich ebony brown of his features. I'm heading towards US-1. Can I drop you anywheres on the way? The chain jet building, please. I'm applying for a job. They rode the rest of the way in silence. Before he opened the door, the driver shook hands with John. Sorry about calling you junk can, but the crowd expected it. He didn't look back as he drove away. John had to wait a half an hour for his turn, but the receptionist finally signaled him toward the door of the interviewer's room. He stepped in quickly and turned to face the man seated at the transplastic desk, an upset little man with permanent worry wrinkles stamped in his forehead. The little man shoved the papers on the desk around angrily, occasionally making crabbed little notes on the margins. He flashed a bird-like glance up at John. Yes, yes, be quick. What is it you want? You posted a help-wanted notice. I... The man cut him off with a wave of his hand. All right. Let me see your ID tag. Quickly, there are others waiting." John thumbed the tag out of his waist slot and handed it across the desk. The interviewer read the code number, then began running his finger down a long list of similar figures. He stopped suddenly and looked sideways at John from under his lowered lids. "'You have made a mistake. We have no opening for you.' John began to explain to the man that the notice had requested his specialty, but he was waved to silence. As the interviewer handed back the tag, he slipped a card out from under the desk blotter and held it in front of John's eyes. He held it there for only an instant, knowing that the written message was recorded instantly by the robot's photographic vision and eidetic memory. 
The card dropped into the ashtray and flared into embers at the touch of the man's pencil heater. John stuffed the ID tag back into the slot and read over the message on the card as he walked down the stairs to the street. There were six lines of typewritten copy with no signature. To Venex Robot, you are urgently needed on a top-secret company project. There are suspected informers in the main office, so you are being hired in this unusual manner. Go at once to 787 Washington Street and ask for Mr. Coleman." John felt an immense sensation of relief. For a moment there he was sure the job had been a false lead. He saw nothing unusual in the method of hiring. The big corporations were immensely jealous of research discoveries and went to great lengths to keep them secret, at the same time resorting to any means to ferret out their business rivals' secrets. There might still be a chance to get this job. The burly bulk of a lifter was moving back and forth in the gloom of the ancient warehouse, stacking crates in ceiling-high rows. John called to him. The robot swung up his forklift and rolled over on noiseless tires. When John questioned him, he indicated a stairwell against the rear wall. Mr. Coleman's office is down and back. The door is marked. The lifter put his fingertips against John's ear pickups and lowered his voice to the merest shadow of a whisper. It would have been inaudible to human ears, but John could hear him easily, the sounds being carried through the metal of the other's body. He's the meanest man you ever met. He hates robots, so be ever so polite. If you can use sir five times in one sentence, you're perfectly safe. John swept the shutter over one eye tube in a conspiratorial wink. The large mech did the same as he rolled away. John turned and went down the dusty stairwell and knocked gently on Mr. Coleman's door. Coleman was a plump little individual in a conservative purple and yellow business suit. He kept glancing from John to the robot general catalog, checking the Venex specifications listed there. Seemingly satisfied, he slammed the book shut. Give me your tag and back against that wall to get measured. John laid his ID tag on the desk and stepped toward the wall. Yes, sir. Uh, here it is, sir. Two sirs on that one, not bad for the first sentence. He wondered idly if he could put five of them in one sentence without the man knowing he was being made a fool of. He became aware of the danger an instant too late. The current surged through the powerful electromagnet behind the plaster, flattening his metal body helplessly against the wall. Coleman was almost dancing with glee. We got him, Druce. He's mashed flatter than a stinking tin can on a rock. Can't move a motor. Bring that junk in here and let's get him ready." Druce had a mechanic's coveralls on over his street suit and a toolbox slung under one arm. He carried a little black metal can at arm's length, trying to get as far from it as possible. Coleman shouted at him with annoyance. "'That bomb can't go off until it's armed. Stop acting like a child. Put it on that grease can's leg, and quick!' Grumbling under his breath, Drew spot-welded the metal flanges of the bomb onto John's leg a few inches above the knee. Coleman tugged at it to be certain it was secure, then twisted a knob in the side and pulled out a glistening length of pin. There was a cold little click from inside the mechanism as it armed itself. John could do nothing except watch. Even his vocal diaphragm was locked by the magnetic field. He had more than a suspicion, however, that he was involved in something other than a secret business deal. He cursed his own stupidity for walking blindly into the situation. The magnetic field cut off, and he instantly raced his extensor motors to leap forward. Coleman took a plastic box out of his pocket and held his thumb over a switch and set into its top. Don't make any quick moves, junkyard. This little transmitter is keyed to a receiver in that bomb on your leg. One touch of my thumb, up you go in a cloud of smoke and come down in a shower of nuts and bolts." He signaled to Druce, who opened a closet door. And in case you want to be heroic, just think of him. Coleman jerked his thumb at the sodden shape on the floor, a filthy attired man of indistinguishable age whose only interesting feature was the black bomb strapped tightly across his chest. He peered unseeingly from red-rimmed eyes and raised the almost empty whiskey bottle to his mouth. Coleman kicked the door shut. He's just some Bowery bum we dragged in, Venix, but that doesn't make any difference to you, does it? He's human, and a robot can't kill anybody. That rummy has a bomb on him tuned to the same frequency as yours. If you don't play ball with us, he gets a two-foot hole blown in his chest. Coleman was right. 
John didn't dare make any false moves. All of his early mental training, as well as Circuit 92 sealed inside his brain case, would prevent him from harming a human being. He felt trapped, caught by these people for some unknown purpose. Coleman had pushed back a tarpaulin to disclose a ragged hole in the concrete floor. The opening extended into the earth below. He waved John over. The tunnel is in good shape for about thirty feet. Then you'll find a fall. Clean all the rock and dirt out until you break through into the storm sewer, then come back. And you better be alone. If you tip the cops, both you and the old stew go out together. Now move! The shaft had been dug recently and shored with packing crates from the warehouse above. It ended abruptly in a wall of fresh sand and stone. John began shoveling it into the little wheelbarrow they had given him. He had emptied four barrow loads and was filling the fifth when he uncovered the hand. A robot's hand, made of green metal. He turned his headlight power up and examined the hand closely. There could be no doubt about it. These gaskets on the joints, the rivet pattern at the base of the thumb, meant only one thing. It was the dismembered hand of a Venex robot. Quickly, yet gently, he shoveled away the rubble behind the hand and unearthed the rest of the robot. The torso was crushed and the power circuits shorted. Battery acid was dripping from an ugly rent in the side. With infinite care, John snapped the few remaining wires that joined the neck to the body and laid the green head on the barrow. It stared at him like a skull, the shutters completely dilated, but no glow of life from the tubes behind them. He was scraping the mud from the number on the battered chest plate when Druce lowered himself into the tunnel and flashed the brilliant beam of a hand spot down its length. Stop playing with that junk and get digging, or you'll end up the same as him. This tunnel has got to be through by tonight. John put the dismembered parts on the barrow with the sand and rock and pushed the whole load back up the tunnel, his thoughts running in unhappy circles. A dead robot was a terrible thing, and one of his family, too. But there was something wrong about this robot, something that was quite inexplicable. The number on the plate had been seventeen. Yet he remembered only too well the day that a water-shorted motor had killed Venex-17 in the Orange Sea. It took John four hours to drive the tunnel as far as the ancient granite wall of the storm sewer. Druce gave him a short pinch bar and he levered out enough of the big blocks to make a hole large enough to let him through into the sewer. When he climbed back into the office he tried to look casual as he dropped the pinch bar to the floor by his feet and seated himself on the pile of rubble in the corner. He moved around to make a comfortable seat for himself, and his fingers grabbed the severed neck of Venex-17. Coleman swiveled around in his chair and squinted at the wall clock. He checked the time against his tie-pin watch. With a grunt of satisfaction, he turned back and stabbed a finger at John. Listen, you green junk pile. At nineteen hundred hours you're going to do a job, and there aren't going to be any slip-ups. You go down that sewer and into the Hudson River. The outlet is underwater, so you won't be seen from the docks. Climb down to the bottom and walk two hundred yards north. That should put you just under a ship. Keep your eyes open, but don't show any lights. About halfway down the keel of the ship you'll find a chain hanging. Climb the chain, pull loose the box that's fastened to the hull at the top, and bring it back here. No mistakes or you know what happens." John nodded his head. His busy fingers had been separating the wires in the amputated neck. When they had been straightened and put into a row, he memorized their order with one flashing glance. He ran over the color code in his mind and compared it with the memorized leads. The twelfth wire was the main cranial power lead. Number six was the return wire. With his precise touch, he separated these two from the pack and glanced idly around the room. Druce was dozing on a chair in the opposite corner. Coleman was talking on the phone, his voice occasionally rising in a petulant whine. This wasn't interfering with his attention to John, and the radio switch still held tightly in his left hand. John's body blocked Coleman's vision. As long as Drew stayed asleep, he would be able to work on the head unobserved. He activated a relay in his forearm, and there was a click as the waterproof cover on an exterior socket swung open. This was a power outlet from his battery that was used to operate motorized tools and lights underwater. If Venex 17's head had been severed for less than three weeks, he could reactivate it. Every robot had a small storage battery inside his skull. If the power to the brain was cut off, the battery would provide the minimum standby current to keep the brain alive. 
The Robie would be unconscious until full power was restored. John plugged the wires into his arm outlet and slowly raised the current to operating level. There was a tense moment of waiting, then Seventeen's eye shutters suddenly closed. When they opened again, the eye tubes were glowing warmly. They swept the room with one glance, then focused on John. The right shutter clicked shut, while the other began opening and closing in rapid fashion. It was international code, being sent as fast as the solenoid could be operated. John concentrated on the message. Telephone. Call emergency operator. Tell her signal fourteen. Help will. The shutter stopped in the middle of a code group, the light of reason dying from the eyes. For one instant John's heart leapt in panic until he realized that Seventeen had deliberately cut the power. Druce's harsh voice rasped in his ear. What are you doing with that? None of your funny robot tricks. I know your kind, plotting all kinds of things in them tin domes. His voice trailed off into a stream of incomprehensible profanity. With sudden spite he lashed his foot out and sent Seventeen's head crashing against the wall. The dented green head rolled to a stop at John's feet the face staring up at him in mute agony. It was only Circuit 92 that prevented him from injuring a human. As his motors revved up to send him hurtling forward, the control relays clicked open. He sank against the debris, paralyzed for the instant. As soon as the rush of anger was gone, he would regain control of his body. They stood as if frozen in a tableau. The robot slumped backward, the man leaning forward, his face twisted with an unreasoning hatred. The head lay between them like a symbol of death. Coleman's voice cut through the air of tenseness like a knife. Druce, stop playing with the grease can and get down to the main door to let little Willie and his junk brokers in. You can have it all to yourself afterward. The angry man turned reluctantly but pushed out of the door at Coleman's annoyed growl. John sat down against the wall, his mind sorting out the few facts with lightning precision. There was no room in his thoughts for Druce. The man had become just one more factor in a complex problem. Call the emergency operator. That meant this was no local matter. Responsible authorities must be involved. Only the government could be behind a thing as major as this. Signal 14. That inferred a complex set of arrangements, forces that could swing into action at a moment's notice. There was no indication where this might lead, but the only thing to do was to get out of here and make that phone call. And quick. Druce was bringing in more people, junk brokers, whatever they were. Any action that he took would have to be done before they returned. Even as John followed this train of logic his fingers were busy. Palming a wrench, he was swiftly loosening the main retaining nut on his hip joint. It dropped free in his hand. Only the pivot pin remained now to hold his leg on. He climbed slowly to his feet and moved towards Coleman's desk. Mr. Coleman, sir, it's time to go down to the ship now. Uh, should I leave now, sir? John spoke the words slowly as he walked forward, apparently going to the door, but angling at the same time towards the plump man's desk. You got thirty minutes yet. Go sit. Say. The words were cut off. Fast as a human reflex is, it is the barest crawl compared to the lightning action of electronic reflex. At the instant Coleman was first aware of John's motion, the robot had finished his leap and lay sprawled across the desk, his leg off at the hip and clutched in his hand. You'll kill yourself if you touch the button. The words were part of the calculated plan. John bellowed them in the startled man's ear as he stuffed the dismembered leg down the front of the man's baggy slacks. It had the desired effect. Coleman's finger stabbed at the button but stopped before it made contact. He stared down with bulging eyes at the little black box of death peeping out of his waistband. John hadn't waited for the reaction. He pushed backward from the desk and stopped to grab the stolen pinch bar off the floor. A mighty one-legged leap brought him to the locked closet. He stabbed the bar into the space between the door and frame and heaved. Coleman was just starting to struggle the bomb out of his pants when the action was over. The closet opened. John seized the heavy strap holding the second bomb on the rummy's chest and snapped it like a thread. He threw the bomb into Coleman's corner, giving the man one more thing to worry about. It had cost him a leg, but John had escaped the bomb threat without injuring a human. Now he had to get to a phone and make that call. Coleman stopped tugging at the bomb and plunged his hand into the desk drawer for a gun. 
The returning men would block the door soon. The only other exit from the room was a frosted glass window that opened onto the mammoth bay of the warehouse. John Venex plunged through the window in a welter of flying glass. The heavy thud of a recoilless seventy-five came from the room behind him, and a foot-long section of metal window frame leaped outward. Another slug screamed by the robot's head as he scrambled toward the rear door of the warehouse. He was a bare thirty feet away from the back entrance when the giant door hissed shut on silent rollers. All the doors would have closed at the same time. The thud of running feet indicated that they would be guarded as well. John hopped a section of packing cases and crouched out of sight. He looked up over his head. There stretched a webbing of steel supports crossing and recrossing until they joined the flat expanse of the roof. To human eyes the shadows there deepened into obscurity, but the infrared from a network of steam pipes gave John all the illumination he needed. The men would be quartering the floor of the warehouse soon. His only chance to escape recapture or death would be over their heads. Besides this, he was hampered by the loss of his leg. In the rafters he could use his arms for faster and easier travel. John was just pulling himself up to one of the topmost crossbeams when a hoarse shout from below was followed by a stream of bullets. They tore through the thin roof. One slug clanged off the steel beam under his body. Waiting until three of the newcomers had started up a nearby ladder, John began to quietly work his way towards the back of the building. Safe for the moment, he took stock of his position. The men were spread out throughout the building. It could only be a matter of time before they found him. The doors were all locked, and he had made a complete circuit of the building to be sure. There were no windows that he could force. The windows were bolted as well. If he could call the emergency operator, the unknown friends of Venex-17 might come to his aid. This, however, was out of the question. The only phone in the building was on Coleman's desk. He had traced the leads to make sure. His eyes went automatically to the cables above his head. Plastic gaskets were set in the wall of the building. Through them came the power and phone lines. The phone line! That was all he needed to make a call. With smooth, fast motions he reached up and scratched a section of wire bare. He laughed to himself as he slipped the little microphone out of his left ear. Now he was half deaf as well as half lame. He was literally giving himself to the cause. He would have to remember the pun to tell Alec Digger later, if there was a later. Alec had a profound weakness for puns. John attached jumpers to the mic and connected them to a bare wire. A touch of the ammeter showed that no one was on the line. He waited a few moments to be sure he had a dial tone, then he sent the eleven carefully spaced pulses that would connect him with the local operator. He placed the mic close to his mouth. Hello, operator. Hello, operator. I cannot hear you, so do not answer. Call the emergency operator. Signal 14. I repeat, signal 14. John kept repeating the message until the searching men began to approach his position. He left the mic connected. The men wouldn't notice it in the dark, but the open line would give the unknown powers his exact location. Using his fingertips he did a careful traverse on an I-beam to an alcove in the farthest corner of the room. Escape was impossible. All he could do was stall for time. Mr. Coleman, I, I'm sorry I ran away. With the volume on full, his voice rolled like thunder from the echoing walls. He could see the men below twisting their heads vainly to find the source. If you let me come back and don't kill me, I will do your work. I was afraid of the bomb, but now I'm afraid of the guns. It sounded a little infantile, but he was pretty sure none of those present had any sound knowledge of robotic intelligence. Please let me come back. Uh, sir. He had almost forgotten the last word, so he added another, please, sir, to make up. Coleman needed that package under the boat very badly. He would promise anything to get it. John had no doubts as to his eventual fate. All he could hope to do was kill time in the hopes that the phone message would bring aid. Come on down, Junkie. I won't be mad at you if you follow directions." John could hear the hidden anger in his voice, the unspoken hatred for a Roby who dared lay hands on him. The descent wasn't difficult, but John did it slowly, with much apparent discomfort. He hopped into the center of the floor, leaning on the cases as if for support. Coleman and Druce were both there, as well as a group of hard-eyed newcomers. They raised their guns at his approach, but Coleman stopped them with a gesture. This is my Roby, boys. I'll see to it that he's happy. 
He raised his gun and shot John's remaining leg off. Twisting around by the blast, John fell helplessly to the floor. He looked up into the smoking mouth of the seventy-five. Very smart for a tin can, but not smart enough. We'll get the junk on the boat some other way, some way that won't mean having you around underfoot. Death looked out of his narrowed eyes. Less than two minutes had passed since John's call. The watchers must have been keeping twenty-four-hour stations waiting for Venex 17's phone message. The main door went down with the sudden scream of torn steel. A whippet tank crunched over the wreck and covered the group with its multiple pom-poms. They were an instant too late. Coleman pulled the trigger. John saw the tensing trigger finger and pushed hard against the floor. His head rolled clear, but the bullet tore through his shoulder. Coleman didn't have a chance for a second shot. There was a fizzing hiss from the tank, and the riot ports released a flood of tear gas. The stricken men never saw the gas-masked police that poured in from the street. John lay on the floor of the police station while a tech made temporary repairs on his leg and shoulder. Across the room, Venex-17 was moving his new body with evident pleasure. Now this really feels like something. I was sure my time was up when that landslip caught me, but maybe I ought to start from the beginning." He stamped across the room and shook John's inoperable hand. The name is Will Counter, 4951L3. Not that that means much any more. I've worn so many different bodies that I forget what I originally looked like. I went right from factory school to a police training school, and I have been on the job ever since. Force of Detectives, Sergeant Junior Grade, Investigation Department. I spend most of my time selling candy bars or newspapers or serving drinks in crumb joints, gather information, make reports, and keep tab on guys for other departments. This last job, and I'm sorry I had to use a Venex identity, I don't think I brought any dishonor to your family. I was on loan to the customs department. Seems a ring was bringing uncut junk, heroin, into the country. FBI tabbed all the operators here, but no one knew how the stuff got in. When Coleman He's the local big shot, called the agencies for an underwater robot. I was packed into a new body and sent running. I alerted the squad as soon as I started the tunnel, but the damn thing caved in on me before I found out what ship was doing the carrying. From there on, you know what happened. Not knowing I was out of the game, the squad sat tight and waited. The hop merchants saw a half million in snow sailing back to the old country, so they had you dragged in as a replacement. You made the phone call, and the cavalry rushed in at the last moment to save two robots from a rusty grave. John, who had been trying vainly to get a word in, saw his chance as Will Counter turned to admire the reflection of his new figure in a window. You shouldn't be telling me those things about your police investigations and department operations. Isn't this information supposed to be secret, especially from robots? Of course it is, was Will's airy answer. Captain Edgecombe. He's the head of my department, is an expert on all kinds of blackmail. I'm supposed to tell you so much confidential police business that you'll have to either join the department or be shot as a possible informer. His laughter wasn't shared by the bewildered John. Truthfully, John, we need you and can use you. Robies that can think fast and act fast aren't easy to find. After hearing about the tricks you pulled in that warehouse, the captain swore to decapitate me permanently if I couldn't get you to join up. Do you need a job? Long hours, short pay, but guaranteed to never get boring. Will's voice was suddenly serious. You saved my life, John. Those snowbirds would have left me in that sand pile until all hell froze over. I'd like you for a mate. I think we could get along well together. The gay note came back into his voice. And besides that, I may be able to save your life some day. I hate owing debts. The tech was finished. He snapped his toolbox shut and left. John's shoulder motor was repaired now. He sat up. When they shook hands this time, it was a firm clasp, the kind you know will last a while. John stayed in an empty cell that night. It was gigantic compared to the hotel and barrack rooms he was used to. He wished that he had his missing leg so he could take a little walk up and down the cell. He would have to wait until the morning. They were going to fix him up then, before he started the new job. He had recorded his testimony earlier, and the impossible events of the past day kept whirling around in his head. He would think about it some other time. Right now all he wanted to do was let his overworked circuits cool down, if he only had something to read to focus his attention on. Then, with a start, he remembered the booklet. 
Everything had moved so fast that the earlier incident with the truck driver had slipped his mind completely. He carefully worked it out from behind the generator shielding and opened the first page of Robot Slaves in a World Economy. A card slipped from between the pages and he read the short message on it. Please destroy this card after reading. If you think there is truth in this book and would like to hear more, come to Room B, 107 George Street, any Tuesday at 5 p.m. The card flared briefly and was gone, but he knew that it wasn't only a perfect memory that would make him remember that message. End of The Velvet Glove by Harry Harrison By Richard E. Lowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. When I Grow Up by Richard E. Lowe. The two professors couldn't agree on the fundamentals of child behavior, but that was before they met little Herbix. The university sprawled casually, unashamed of its disordered ranks, over a hundred thousand acres of grassy, rolling countryside. It was the year A.D. 3896, and the vast assemblages of schools and colleges and laboratories had been growing on this site for more than two thousand years. It had survived political and industrial revolutions, local insurrections, global interterrestrial and nuclear wars, and it had become the acknowledged center of learning for the entire known universe. No subject was too small to escape attention at the university. None was too large to be attacked by the fearless probing fingers of curiosity, or to in any way overawe students and teachers in this great institution of learning. No book was ever closed in the university, and no clue, however tiny, was discarded as useless in the ceaseless search for knowledge which was the university's prime and overriding goal. For no matter how fast and far the spaceships might fly, or what strange creatures might be brought back across the great curve of the universe, or how deeply the past was resurrected or the future probed, of one thing only was the university quite sure. Man did not know enough. All manner of schools had come into being at the university, and often they functioned in pairs, one devoted to proving a proposition and the other to disproving it. And among these pairs of schools, two in particular seemed to exist on a most tenuous basis. Their avowed mission was to settle the age-old argument concerning the relative influences of heredity and environment. One, headed by Professor Milchek von Posenfeller, worked tirelessly to prove that there was no such determining factor as heredity and that environment alone was the governing influence in human behavior. The other, under the direction of Dr. Arthur D. Smithlawn, was dedicated to the task of proving that environment meant nothing, and that only heredity was important. Success, in short, could only come to those who were born with the genes of success in their bodies, and failure was as preordained for the rest as was ultimate death for all. Over a period of more than two hundred years, the School of Environment had been taking babies from among the thousands of homeless waifs gathered in throughout the universe, and raising them carefully in a closely supervised cultural atmosphere. The School of Heredity, on the other hand, was more select. Its pupils came only from families whose genealogy could be traced back for at least a thousand years. Freedom of choice and expression was the rule here, since the school was attempting to prove that a child's inherited tendencies will send it inevitably along a predetermined path, completely uninfluenced by outside help or hindrance. In two centuries neither school had been able to develop an overpowering case in support of its own theory. Hence they both thrived and cheerfully ignored the discrepancies which existed in the case records of individuals who had not turned out according to the book. Although they were zealous professional rivals, Professor von Posenfeller and Dr. Smithlawn were devoted personal friends. They called each other Posey and Smithy, and got together once a week to play chess and exchange views on the universe in general. Only one subject was taboo between them, their experimental work. On this particular Saturday night, however, Smithy noticed that his good friend Posey was terribly agitated and disturbed, and had for the third time carelessly put his queen in jeopardy. 
My dear friend, exclaimed Posey, blindly moving his king into check, could you possibly be persuaded to ignore for the moment our ban on professional talk? There is something. Smithy secretly was only too anxious to talk at great length, but he pretended to give the request serious consideration. If it's really important, he said, yes, by all means, go right ahead. Smithy, Posey plunged on, I am nonplussed. I am really terribly disturbed. I've never felt like this before. Smithy waited patiently while Posey poured himself a large brandy and soda, hastily gulped it down, and made a face as he regretted the action. How much do you know about our methods of working in the School of Environment? the professor asked, taking a new tack. Nothing, of course, replied Smithy. The statement was not precisely true, but Smithy was not yet ready to confess that he had spies in his friend's school. Well, then, said Posey, knowing full well that Smithy had been getting reports on his college for many years and feeling secretly glad that he, in turn, had been spying. Well, then, he repeated, you should be aware that we know absolutely nothing about the children we enroll. Most of them are infants. We do not know who their parents were or where they were born, except for the obvious clues which their bodies furnish. We do not even know their national or racial origins. We bring them up with absolutely equal treatment, the finest of everything. At the age of five we divide them arbitrarily into classes and begin training them for occupations. Some we educate as scholars, some laborers, some professional men. In me, dear friend, you see one of the triumphs of our methods. I myself was a foundling, raised and educated in the School of Environment. Whatever I may be, I owe to the school." He paused to give Smithy a chance to digest the statement. Of course, Posey continued, we take into consideration such factors as physical build and muscular development. We don't train undersized boys to be freight handlers, but in general the division is arbitrary, and you'd be amazed how they respond to it. To keep a check on things, we interview our students twice a year to see how much they have learned. We always ask them what they want to be when they grow up. That enables us to determine whether or not the training is really taking hold. Occasionally, it is true, we find a case where the schooling seems to run counter to natural aptitudes. Smithy could not resist interrupting. Natural aptitudes? I am surprised to hear you use such an expression. I thought you furnished your students with aptitudes through environmental conditioning." Stiffly Posey retorted, "'Sometime we will have a full, objective discussion of the matter. It is not pertinent at this moment. Of course, I believe in natural or instinctive aptitudes, but I do not believe that they are inherited from parents or even from remote ancestors.' "'Cosmic rays, perhaps?' needled Smithy and became instantly sorry when his friend's face began to redden. Posey didn't believe in cosmic rays, obviously. Smithy apologized. Posey sighed deeply and made a fresh start. My friend, he said, in your work, as I understand it, you learn everything you can about a student's past and about his progenitors. By doing so, you hope to be able to predict his future abilities, his likes and dislikes. But what course do you pursue when you find a boy who just doesn't prove out according to the prognostications?" Smithy mumbled a few evasive words in reply, but refused to be drawn into giving a positive answer. Never mind, Posey said. What would you say if I asked a boy what he liked or what he wanted to do, and his answer concerned something that never existed or had never been dreamed of, something horrible? Smithy's eyebrows perked up. He made no attempt to conceal the fact that his interest had been aroused. "'What precisely do you mean?' he demanded. "'Just this,' Posey said, leaning forward to give emphasis to his words. "'We have a boy who is being trained as a space navigator. He is very bright. He is of medium build, as spacemen must be, and he learns easily and willingly. We are sure now that he will be ready for pre-space school two years before he reaches the minimum age. Yet whenever this boy is asked what he wants to do, he replies, I want to be a destructor. Smithy's lips parted, but for a moment he remained completely silent while his mind stumbled over the strange term. Destructor, he repeated at last. Wait, said Posey, and listen carefully. This boy is now ten years old. He first gave me that answer three days ago. He repeated it two days ago, then yesterday, and again today. I had never interviewed him before. I never interview a student personally until the tenth year, so I quite naturally had his files double-checked. Smithy, he's been giving the same answer ever since he was five years old. 
two interviews a year for six years, and three extra ones this week. Imagine! Fifteen times this boy has said he wants to be a destructor, and no one even knows what a destructor is. Well, Smithy said with a shrug, convinced that Posey was getting all excited over nothing. I admit it seems strange and highly single-minded for so young a boy, but don't you imagine it's some word he just made up? I admitted that as a possibility until this morning. But look here. Posey reached behind his chair and took up a small leather bag. Slowly he unzipped it and delved inside. Then with a grim flourish he brought forth the body of a cat. As Smithy's eyes widened, Posey said dramatically, Smithy, that boy killed this cat with a glance. W with a what? A glance. You heard me correctly. He just looked at the cat and the beast dropped dead. And he did it to other things, too. A sparrow, a baby fox. Why, he even did it to a rat that had been cornered by this very cat. I tell you, I had never been so shaken by anything in all my life. I said to myself, Posey, have you got yourself a mutant? No, I replied. He's completely normal in every respect, physically and otherwise. He's a bit brighter than average, perhaps ninety-eight-six in his studies, including elementary astrophysics. He speaks brilliantly, composes poetry, even invents little gadgets. He's a genius, maybe, but not a mutant. Then I asked myself, how do you account for the cat? Posey paused, inferentially transferring the question to his friend. I can't account for the cat, Smithy said, unless we assume its death was a coincidence. But I confess you've aroused my curiosity. Could I see and talk to this boy who wants to be a, he grimaced, a destructor? I'm glad you asked, Posey sighed with relief. Actually, he is outside now waiting to join us, but I must warn you that you will find him quite precocious. However, he's extremely amenable. Posey went quickly to the door, opened it, and called, Herbex, come in. The boy entered. He was, Smithy observed, a quite ordinary-looking boy. He was so obviously ten years old that you couldn't say he was either old or young, large or small, fat or thin, or anything else, for his age. He was just ten years old and a boy. Herbix, said Posey, I want you to meet a friend of mine, the famous Dr. Smithlawn. How do you do, sir? Herbex said politely. How do you do? returned Smithy. He had already decided not to be patronizing, but to take a bold, frank, comradely course with the lad. Herbex, he said, Professor von Posenfeller has been telling me the story of your life. Now you tell me, Herbex, not what you want to be when you grow up, but why. I, I don't know, sir, Herbex replied easily. I only know that I want to be a destructor. But, Herbex, what is a destructor? Herbex looked around the room. He saw Smithy's birdcage, walked over to it, and stared for a moment quietly at Dicky, the doctor's parakeet. Dicky looked back, chirped angrily twice, and toppled from his perch. He landed on his back, his tiny feet rigid and unmoving. He was quite dead, Smithy observed, with a sudden detached unbelieving horror. Why, Dicky was seven years old, and he had been as good a pet as any lonely old professor could have desired as a cheery avian companion. Look here, young man, he began sternly. Then, as the shock passed, he hastily changed his tone. Suppose this child did have some strange sort of power, mystic, perhaps, but definitely abnormal. He may belong in the school of the future, Smithy thought, or perhaps the school of the past, the Dark Ages Department, but not here. Don't worry, sir, Herbix said. I can't do it to you. But do what? Smithy cried. What? did you do? I destructed. Smithy took a deep breath. He felt as though a cruel hoax had been played on him. After all, Posey could have lied about the cat and the other creatures, and the boy was quite obviously bright enough to learn lines and to play a part. But how to explain Dicky? He tried to calculate the coincidental odds that might have caused Dicky to die a natural death at one precise instant in time under unusual and exact circumstances. They proved to be incalculable to his unmathematical brain. He rubbed his face with the palms of both hands, then he turned abruptly to Posey. I just don't know what to say about it, he explained. How could I know? How could anybody know? He faced the boy again. Look here, Herbix. This, this power of yours, when did you first notice you had it? Last year, sir. I always knew I would do it sometime. 
But one day I was looking at a bird perched on my windowsill, and it fell over dead, just as your parakeet did. I thought it was an accident or a coincidence, but then the next day it happened again, with a squirrel. Soon I got to where I could do it on purpose, but I don't know how. Well, how do you feel about it? Do you want to kill these harmless pets? Oh, no, sir, I don't want to kill them. I just want to be a destructor. Smithy had a sudden disquieting conviction that he was in the presence of some completely alien, dangerous being. A cold breeze seemed to shiver through the room, though he knew his quarters were airtight and perfectly ventilated. This is ridiculous, he told himself, turning to Posey with a helpless shrug, to feel like this over such a nice-looking young lad. My friend, he said, all this has occurred so suddenly I must have time to think. Such a thing could never have happened in my school. Perhaps you should, but doubtless it has already occurred to you, turn him over to the physio-psychological rebuilding. Posey nodded. It has, of course, but then I said to myself, Posey, there are a bunch of dunderheaded old fossils over there. They can take a criminal and tear him apart and make a good citizen out of him, granted. But do they find out why he was a criminal? Have they reduced the number of new criminals? No. And they would not find out why this boy wants to be a destructor, nor even what a destructor is. You're right, I told myself. And besides, Herbix is a nice boy. Why, with this power of his, if he wanted to do harm, there wouldn't be an animal left alive around the whole university. And if he could do it to people, he's had many an opportunity to practice on me. But has he? No, not once. Besides, if you keep him in school, you can maintain a good close watch over him. Herbix has promised to keep me fully informed as to the progress of his strange power. If he feels it getting stronger, he will let me know immediately. Isn't that right, Herbix?" Yes, sir, said the boy quietly. You are quite sure, Smithy asked, that you know absolutely nothing about this boy's past, his parents, his birthplace, anything at all? There must be some clue. You know very well I don't. Posey retorted angrily. I just thought that perhaps you might have subjected him to hypno-research, Smithy said placatingly. I wouldn't dream of such a thing, Posey began, and stopped with a gasp. How did you know about that? he demanded. Smithy was flustered. I, well, that is, he could think of no convincing answer. Hypno-research was one of Posey's most secret projects. He had used it constantly in his efforts to determine reasons for nonconformity to set patterns of behavior in some of his more recalcitrant students. He had kept it a secret because it added up to an admission that perhaps heredity could play a part in the development of a student's character. Smithy, my dear old friend, he said with mock humility, this is no time for us to quarrel. Let us face the facts candidly. You have been spying on my school, and I in turn have been spying on yours. I know, for instance, that when your students don't behave the way their heredity charts predict, you often use hypnotherapy to change their thought lines and force them to conform. Is that any less fair than what I do?" Smithy sighed. I guess not, my friend. No, wait. I will go farther than that. It is not a matter of guessing. I am quite certain about it. We are a couple of aging frauds, struggling selfishly along, playing with the lives of these children solely to keep our jobs. Perhaps we should— Nevertheless, we have a problem, interrupted Posey. It's a problem that won't be solved by our becoming senile idiots. Get your mind back on Herbix and help me. I feel this is a most desperate situation. If it gets beyond just the two of us, we are likely to be thoroughly investigated. Then goodness knows what would happen. But why? The child can do no real harm. Suppose he does destruct an animal or two. There are plenty more. And sooner or later they would die of natural causes anyway. And it's unthinkable that he could ever do it to, to people." Smithy paused, obviously struck by a startling thought. He turned to Herbix. Boy, he said quite sternly, come here. Herbix obeyed, advancing to within a foot of the old doctor and facing him squarely. Look me in the eyes, Smithy commanded. Questioningly, Herbix began to stare at Smithy. Well, Smithy said after a time, turn it on. A set look came over Herbix's face. His lips were compressed, and a thin dew of sweat had broken out on his forehead. Posey stood aghast, slowly comprehending what his old friend Smithy was doing. He was actually risking his life, or so he believed, to prove that the child could not destruct a human being. He wanted to stop the boy, but he could not move from where he stood. 
Suddenly Herbix broke and turned away. He began to sob. It's no use, he cried. I, I can't do it. I just can't do it. Smithy went to him and put an arm on his shoulders. Tell me, boy, he exclaimed, what do you mean? Do you mean that you can't bring yourself to do it, or that it is physically impossible? Herbix just stood there, his head bowed, crying wildly. I, I just can't do it, he repeated, sounding now completely heartbroken. Posey, coming alive again, said soothingly, Don't cry, son. It's not bad. It's good that you can't do it. Herbix whirled around, facing Posey, his face inflamed with a sudden rage. But I will, he screamed. I will do it. I will. When I grow up. End of When I Grow Up by Richard E. Lowe